everyone. It's good to see everybody. We're continuing our fiscal year 23-24 budget deliberations. As with the last few sessions, we'll begin by quickly going around the table and introducing ourselves so that listeners understand who is in the room and around the table. I'm Ted Wheeler. I'm the mayor. I went towards Rubio last time. I'll go towards Gonzalez this time. I'm Commissioner Gonzalez. Commissioner Ryan. Hi. City Budget Director. Shannon Fairchild, City Budget Office. Farshad Aladati, business, uh, I'm business services manager at uh, BES. Jeremy Patton, business services group director at PBOT. Tara Wazak, interim director of PBOT. Donnie Chiama, director at BES. Jeff Selby, uh, he, him pronouns, interim director of the Office of Equity and Human Rights. And my name is Mangus Maps, and I'm the commissioner in charge of the Public Works Bureaus. Uh, commissioner Carmen Rubio, she, her. All right, this year's budget work sessions are organized by our service areas, administration, public safety, public works, culture and livability, and community and economic development. Today we'll dive into the service area of public works, to which Commissioner Mingus Maps is the commissioner in charge. Before I hand this off to the commissioner, I want to remind listeners of the two remaining work sessions next week, March 20th, will focus on culture and livability, and March 23rd will focus on community and economic development. There's also three budget listening sessions for community input. Those are taking place next Tuesday, March 21st, from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m., Monday, April 10th, from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m., and Saturday, April 15th, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Both work sessions, as well as the budget listening sessions, are available on the City of Portland YouTube page. <coughs> Community members can sign up to speak at the budget listening sessions by visiting the City Budget Office website, which is www.portlandoregon.gov forward slash CBO. www. Oh my gosh, let's see if I can speak. No. It's been a long day. www.portlandor. <laughs> It's really going to be a long session. Yeah, we have three hours for this worry. session. I'll do most of the spit this today. out by the end of it. www.portland.gov forward slash CBO. Click on the fiscal year 23 24 budget events tab to find the links. With that, with blissfulness, I turn this over to Commissioner Mingus Maps. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, commissioners, distinguished guests. I'm pleased to kick off our public works budget work session. Um, and I'd like to start out by quoting um, our chief administrative officer, Mike Jordan, who likes to say the public works bureaus are in the 100-year business. Our roads, our sewer systems, and the pipes that bring fresh water to our homes every day must stand the test of time. In fact, some of the public infrastructure that we use today was first installed when Portland was founded. And I will tell you, some of the public works infrastructure that we are building right now today will still be in service generations from now. Next slide, please. We have the, is that the, oh, there we go. Um, this is the first time uh, the Public Works Bureaus will be presenting their budgets together as a group. Today we will hear from uh, PBOT, we will hear from BES, and we will hear from Water. Next slide, please. I'm trying. I think I'm looking for common themes. I'm sorry? There we go. Uh, thank you. Now, colleagues and friends uh, and folks watching at home, uh, um, I want to give you a preview about what we're going to hear today. Um, in the presentations that we will um, uh, be witness to, to today, you will notice several common themes that run through all three of these bureaus. For example, all three of these bureaus provide essential services. All of these bureaus face unique constraints around financial and revenue um, issues. Each of these bureaus is deeply committed to uh, making sure that we provide uh, services at an affordable rate. Each of these bureaus faces unique security um, and safety issues. 
and each of these issues is committed to permit reform. Um, and let me place these bureaus into some context for you. Um, our infrastructure bureaus um, are responsible for the assets that help make Portland livable. Uh, and they make Portland livable by delivering good roads, clean water, and effective treatment of sewers, or, or sewage. These services are also critical, a critical part of how the city achieves our long-term climate and equity goals. In addition, our public works bureaus are constrained by some unique financial restrictions. For example, uh, the water and sewer uh, rate funds uh, can only be uh, spent on costs that are reasonably related to providing water and sewer services. And over at PBOT, state highway funds can only be spent on the construction, improvement, maintenance, operation, and use of public highways, roads, and streets. Further, over at PBOT, you know, we have some revenue through um, our parking meters, uh, and that revenue is very important to the Bureau, but those revenues must cover the cost of operating the meter system first before any excess revenues can be spent uh, for other purposes. And there are some other themes that you will see run through all three bureaus. For example, each of these bureaus is deeply committed to making sure that the services that we provide are affordable. Why? Well, because affordability is a driving factor in making Portland a livable place. And finally, as we uh, wrap up the commonalities that uh, will connect all three of these bureaus, you will see that um, each of these bureaus is committed to permit reform, and we are committed to the safety and security both of our employees and of the critical infrastructure we maintain. Now, let's go to the next slide. I would like to point out that the budgets and the services provided by the Public Works Bureaus also support uh, this council's priorities, including livability, economic vitality, houselessness, and community safety. Uh, let me uh, expand on that for you a little bit today. Our infrastructure bureaus contribute to livability by providing clean water, um, by facilitating transportation, and by uh, helping keep our environment clean. Uh, the uh, essential services provided by these bureaus also contribute to our community's vitality. For example, let's think back to the pandemic and the way PBOT uh, um, really stepped up and helped support Portland's economy by supporting new programs such as the Healthy Business Program, which allowed restaurants to stay open and serve patrons in a safe manner. Um, these bureaus if, um, also are committed to uh, permitting reform. And uh, these bureaus also play an important role in addressing the challenges posed by houselessness. For example, again, to uh, highlight PBOT, PBOT spends $3 million a year on our derelict RV program and $1.3 million a year on campsite cleanups. In addition, over at Environmental Services, uh, we fund the RV Pump Out Program, which is frankly one of my favorite programs, where we go around and collect black water from uh, uh, folks who are living in RVs. Uh, one of the reasons why we do that is both to be humane and decent human beings, and also to protect our waterways from uh, biohazards. And finally, I really want to applaud and hold up the way uh, in which um, both the Water Bureau and BES um, have uh, really committed to having robust financial assistance programs that help keep um, economically vulnerable Portlanders in their homes. And now let's take a moment and talk a little bit about community safety. Now, uh, one of my goals as your new uh, PBOT commissioner is to bring down the number of fatalities we see on our streets. I think we all um, have noticed the uh, Vision Zero report, which the Bureau released earlier this week. Um, our track record in this space, uh, to be blunt, has not been good. I'm committing to making it better. And we're gonna make it better by making investments in Vision Zero, sidewalks and structures, street lights, and signal and traffic cameras. Now, BES and water also play a role in community safety by providing safe drinking water to the public and by keeping uh, biohazards out of our rivers. Um, I would also point out, um, like many of other bureaus out there, we are also committed in the uh, Public Works Bureaus uh, to enhanced security services for our critical infrastructure sites. We do that because if these uh, sites get knocked offline, um, 
to be frank, uh, Portlanders will not be able to flush their toilets or drink the water. That's just mission, mission critical. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, here we're going to take a look at budgets. Um, the public works arena contains three of the city's largest bureaus. They account for half of the city's entire budget, a third of the city's employees, and 95% of the city's assets. Um, and now, after that overly long introduction, I'd like to invite uh, our bureau directors and staff to address council and provide more detail on each of their annual resources, requirements, and budget requests. Uh, why don't we start out today with PBOT. I have the great honor of, of introducing uh, our interim director, Tara Waziak. Uh, welcome, director. Thank you, Commissioner Ramps. Good afternoon, Mayor, commissioners, colleagues. I am Tara Waziak, the Interim Director of PBOT. Uh, with me today is Jeremy Patton, our Business Services Group Director. Uh, next slide, please. As Commissioner Maps pointed out, uh, PBOT is a community partner in shaping a livable city. We plan, build, manage, and maintain the transportation system that provides people and businesses access and mobility. As you may know, PBOT is in a state of revenue crisis. Our five-year revenue forecast shows losses of over $60 million in discretionary resources. As such, our fiscal year 23-24 budget includes reductions totaling $6.3 million and 16 positions. Despite these financial challenges, though, PBOT continues to deliver infrastructure improvements and services. And we are doing our part to address the houselessness crisis and contribute to the economic vitality and livability of our city. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jeremy so we can dive into some of the specifics of our requested budget and our revenue challenges. Thank you, Tara. So I'm going to spend the next couple of slides just kind of going over the, the massive PBOT $500 million budget and trying to break it down into individual pieces um, for discussion. So on this first slide, this is a, a general overview of the PBOT budget. And so you can see in the upper left, we have a $500 million budget. About $200 million of that is for capital another 200 million for operating, and then the remaining about $100 million is for debt service and contingencies within the Bureau. Right below that, you'll see our FTE by fiscal year, and what I wanna point out here is we've seen a drop of about 25 FTE from fiscal year 2021 into the current requested budget. But at the same time, if you look at that graph on the right, you will see our personnel services has actually increased by 25% over that time due to uh, labor agreements, increases in benefits, salary increases, et cetera. So although we are seeing a drop um, in our personnel totals, we are seeing an increase in the, in the budget side of things. And again, you'll see in 22-23, it's a, it's a rather large increase from previous years. Most of that is due to fall bump and the carryovers within the fall bump and rebudgeting in that. And to so see it drop it back down uh, in 23-24 moving forward. And probably the last thing to comment on this particular slide is although our budget has been increasing, the purchasing power of that, of that dollar has reduced. And, and we'll talk about it a little bit uh, as, we, as we move through the slides. So our capital budget, which we just talked about, $200 million. Um, what I mostly want to point out here is you can see in the pie graph, we have a number of resources um, that we try and you know, scrape together to fund the PBOT's capital budget. Most of these resources are one time in nature. Um, a few of the, the key components, I think, for our capital plan is the general fund resources, specifically out of the capital set aside and out of Build Portland. We've relied a lot on these resources to fund our ADA ramp um, program throughout the years. It's usually a $1.8 million program uh, that we request the capital set aside every single year. So we're, we're hoping there's still an opportunity to get some of those funds from the general fund this particular year. The general transportation revenue you can see is about another $15 million of our, of our capital program, but about half of that is one time. A lot of that's for carryover resources or for bond proceeds. The remaining of that, um, about 15 million, about half of that is for our ADA ramp program. So the majority of our resources from general transportation resources are going in to fund that ADA ramp program. And then the final piece here is around fixing our streets. Uh, another big portion, and again, um, it's a, it's a one-time resource in that we have to go back to the voters in 2024 to get that um, re-upped. And if those funds go away, that's another $16 million reduction that we'll have to see in our capital program. Maybe just jump back to that oh, real quick. No, sorry. Just one more comment on the, on the right. You can see we have about a $200 million program, but if you can see in the five-year plan, it drops to about $30 million. 
The reason for that is, is they're mostly one-time resources. We don't know where the funding is going to come from in the future, so we don't quite know what projects we're going to be able to fund with those resources. So um, it's not a, it's an accurate presentation of our five-year plan, but just know that that capital program will be larger than $30 million in five years. Now, now with the gentleman. Thank you, Farshad. Um, this graph is trying to show kind of how we, we have a $500 million PBOT program, but what you will mostly hear us talking about is about $150 million in resources. And those resources are general transportation resources, and those come from the parking um, ops, parking meters, parking citation revenues, and our state highway uh, fund revenues. There's a little bit of detail on the slides you can look at just kind of talking about how we, you know, how we get down to that number by reducing a number of the one-time kind of set-asides and, and other restricted resources. Um, but we really want to kind of focus the next few slides just looking at that $145 million number um, and, and the reductions that we're kind of facing moving forward. So general transportation revenue. So we have some challenges, um, as you can see on this slide. State highway funds are projected to remain flat or decrease due to losses in Portland population, transitions to electric vehicles, and the lack of regular statewide increases in gas taxes to account for inflation. And maybe just one thing to note on that, that population, it's not necessarily just the overall population of Portland, it's the percent of the population of Portland compared to the other jurisdictions within Oregon. And that percentage has decreased, which then flows through the amount of money that we get from our state highway funds. Parking revenue also saw significant reductions during the pandemic, and those revenues continue to lag based on previous uh, projections. And that assumes the 40 cent meter increase um, that is scheduled to come through our rate ordinance in May. And then as you can see on the far right column, this is just kind of a, a high level look at our resources um, on our five year plan and the losses that we are expecting in each of those categories. Total is about $70 million and we have about $10 million in balancing reserves, which is where you get the $60 million shortfall over the five year plan. And so this slide is another just kind of visual representation that just kind of shows our, our bleak fiscal situation. Um, as you can see, these are cumulative um, losses of revenue over the 10-year plan. The top lines just kind of show the, what we call our um, jaws of death, um, which is basically the difference between revenues and expenses over the next 10 years. Um, and as you can see from this, just within our ninth year of the plan, we are already in a deficit more than the actual the, the yearly revenues that come in from general transportation resources. So we have some pretty significant shortfalls um, coming up um, over the next uh, nine to 10 years. This slide is showing kind of what we have done to date to address um, these shortfalls in revenues and what we kind of plan to do in the future. So we spent the last four years making reductions uh, to address our revenue shortfalls, which total about 15.8%. Or forecast, assuming the 23-24 reductions are taken and the meter increase is approved, still requires us to deplete our balancing reserves and cut another $12.1 million in the fiscal year 24-25 budget to balance a 10-year forecast. Um, we look out 10 years. We know we're only required to do a five-year balance forecast, but most of those cuts are in, in that five-year window. We're actually required in next year's budget, 24-25, to cut $9.1 million of that $12.1 million to balance that five-year forecast. And again, um, Without the 40 cent meter increase, it will look, it would be another four and a half percent of ongoing reductions that we'll have to take in 24, 25 on top of the 7.7. So the next slide is around just a little bit of background on our reduction packages. So we have $6.3 million reduction package in our current requested budget. These are ongoing reductions across a number of programs within PBOT. The small capital projects reduction of $1.5 million reduces the yearly funding available for small capital project investments in areas such as sidewalks, crossings, bike safety improvements, um, and other safety improvements across, uh, across the Bureau. We haven't identified these projects yet, but those projects will be identified as we, as we move forward. Residential street sweeping reduction eliminates the residential street sweeping except for those streets in the Leaf Districts. No permanent positions will be eliminated as part of this reduction, and those positions will be reassigned to focus on vegetation management and street area landscaping. But we do see some of the savings through the reduction in seasonal work over time and some of the disposal costs. Support for community events. We are seizing support for special events with minor exceptions. This includes the elimination of two positions and the production, storage, and setup and pickup of street closure barricades and on-site support for bike rides, runs, parades, and other festivals. 
We're eliminating positions in consulting services in the code and plan development area. We're eliminating two parking enforcement officers and vehicle rental fees. Um, we are reallocating some existing resources within PBOT, which includes some of our mobile technology fees, meter replacement reserves, and some um, money that we are getting through stiff resources to support our core GTR programs. So these were funds event, um, implemented supposedly to increase services in these particular areas, and what we have to do is offset existing service levels with those revenues. This includes also the, the transportation of dispatch services to the city's 311 uh, services, which saves uh, general transportation revenues. And finally, we're eliminating two positions within our maintenance operations staff and sidewalk preservation and street maintenance and reducing our fleet pool by a half a million dollars. And so kind of um, moving forward, we've got four options um, that we've, we're kind of putting out on the table um, for further discussion to kind of help balance that $12 million 10-year forecast or 10-year shortfall that we're looking at. The first is to, um, it'll, Oh, to, to request general fund support for a number of programs. So this includes uh, derelict RVs, campsite cleanups, some debt service um, on the Selwood Bridge and Portland Milwaukee Light Rail. There is an option to increase uh, the fixing our streets gas taxes. As we move forward in 2024, we could look at doubling the amount of the temporary gas tax from 10 cents to 20 cents. Um, there are some additional risks with that approach, given that it's a, it's a vote of the public, requires a vote of the public, and if the public votes no, we could lose the additional $16 million that we're asking for, but also the $16 million that is currently supporting existing programs. Or we could look at um, further reductions, which we've talked about in previous slides, or exploring new revenue options. And I, I wanna say these are, these are not ors, these are more ands. We're looking at, hopefully, um, looking at a number, you know, taking kind of items from each of these buckets to try and address that longer term shortfall. And I think that wraps up most of the finances. I'll turn it back over to Tara for the performance <coughs> indicators. All right, these are just a snapshot of some of our key performance indicators. So despite a revenue crisis and the operating challenges of the pandemic, PBOT has continued its commitment to providing critical transportation services to keep Portlanders moving, no matter how they choose to travel. So starting in the upper left, uh, we continue to achieve our annual target of constructing 1,500 ADA certified curb ramps as required by the Creek Settlement. Uh, moving to the top right, uh, we are also growing our Bike Town Bike Share program, which led to record-breaking record -breaking ridership last year. We filled over 10,500 potholes in fiscal 21-22. And our street car ridership saw a steady uh, re recovery, um, which like all transit had a drop during the pandemic, but is on the uptick. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So we um, continue to be proud of how our Bureau shows up uh, to keep Portland, Portlanders moving, um, but we are also facing challenges that require significant resources, as, as we mentioned. The unacceptably high level of traffic fatalities on our streets is one of our most significant challenges. As you can see in the top left, Portland, like cities across the country, has experienced a high level of traffic deaths that has persisted since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. Using our data-driven approach with Vision Zero, we know that speed and impairment continue to be uh, contributing factors in deadly crashes. Hit and run crashes are also on the rise. 17 people died in hit and run crashes in 2022 compared to seven people in 2020. We also know that darkness plays a role in crashes with 72% of fatal crashes occurring in low light. So at night and dawn and during dusk hours. And 93% of pedestrian crashes occur during low light conditions as well. So moving on to the top right, our pavement condition index. Funding from Fi Fix Our Streets, our local 10 cent per gallon tax at the pump has helped keep our good roads in good conditions, which is fantastic. That said, we still have a substandard pavement condition index of rating of 56%, meaning that most of our roads are in poor or very poor condition. And roads that are in poor or very poor condition require expensive full reconstruction. We estimate that bringing our streets up to good condition across the city 
would cost about $3.4 billion, which makes up a substantial amount of our overall unmet need of $4.7 billion. Moving on to the bottom left, we have seen a significant increase in derelict RVs reported to PBOT this last fiscal year. As more of our parking enforcement staff focus on livability issues and we re reassign them to work on abandoned autos and derelict RVs, we have fewer officers enforcing parking and therefore collecting revenue. We pay about $3,000 per RV for towing and demolition. And with over 651 RVs already towed this fiscal year, we are on track to quadruple the number of RVs removed from city streets this fiscal year at a significant cost to the Bureau. Moving on to the bottom right, uh, lastly, um, we are in a climate crisis and we need to reduce the number of trips taken by car. And although more people started teleworking during the pandemic, it uh, barely made a dent in the percentage of Portland residents who took who commute to work by car, one of the leading causes of carbon emissions. We need resources and leadership support to speed up our work if we want to meet the 2035 climate and mobility goals in the Portland Transportation System Plan. So with that, uh, I'll stop there. That includes our formal presentation, but if uh, you have any questions or comments, we do have some time. Uh, yeah, why don't you start? I've got a couple myself. Thank you. Uh, Appreciated the comprehensive report. Uh, do want to thank PBOT, Commissioner Maps, uh, to primarily to acknowledge the work your bureau is doing to address many difficult vexing issues, including derelict RVs that has become at the forefront for many Portlanders. There's many, many other parts of PBOT uh, that are touching everyday Portlanders, but it's one that we hear about all the time. Um, fully want to recognize the structural funding issues inside of PBOT that limits your bureau's ability to address this issue. Um, appreciate what you've been able to do on it, um, but fully recognize that this, the scale of what the community is asking here is, is greater than what we can currently provide there. Um, fully recognize that your funding needs are structural in nature <coughs> and persistent and ongoing. And one of these days as a community, we'll figure this out, I'm hoping. Uh, how do we have a sustainable uh, funding model for PBOT that will carry us over to the next decade, much less broader 21st century realities. So I just want to thank you and uh, uh, for what you're doing with the resources you have, and um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Commissioner. I have a couple of questions. First of all, you mentioned the uh, Fixing Our Streets initiative going back to the voters in 2024. I have what may seem as a, a rudimentary question. Does it matter whether it goes in May or November? And I'm assuming even though the city council races are now only in November that there will still be a spring ballot. Are, are we starting the planning for that ballot measure? I assume we are. I mean, it's coming up mm -hmm. very quickly. Yeah, we are. Do, do we have a strategy yet in terms of when that might go to the voters? I think the strategy May. is in May. Yeah. Is May. Yeah, that, yeah. that would be my hunch as well. And it'll be a noticeably quiet ballot uh, just by virtue of the, the changes in the city charter. So I think that's a good opportunity for us. You noted that uh, enforcement has declined. Uh, can you explain that? Um, we shifted resources from some a uh, couple parking enforcement positions um, because parking hasn't recovered. It's not at full cost recovery model. It's not okay. And so, so that was my we question. We needed more. Uh, okay, resources. so you actually do save money by reducing enforcement officers. Yeah. You noted on one of your slides that uh, general fund was restricted. You put it in the column of restricted revenue sources. I, that struck me as odd. I feel the general fund is extremely flexible. So why was it identified as a restricted revenue source? Yeah, the majority of the general fund resources that are coming in are for specific projects that the general fund has asked us to do. We receive, oh, I think, I just under 40,000 of discretionary. Okay, by the time yeah. it gets to you, it's been allocated Correct. by council. Correct. Got it. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Good. In that case, I'm glad you see it as restricted. <laughs> thank you. Um, I was a little confused about the revenue shortfalls projected over the nine to 10 year period that you showed. And it's not a slight shortfall, it's a massive gap. 
And I think I heard you say, although I, I'm not sure and I want to clarify, did you say that you were going to cover that gap using reserves? No, we have utilized all of our reserves to cover the gap over the last few years and it projected to use the rest of that next year's in next year's. So budget, what is yeah. the strategy then given that the next time we turn around 10 years will have gone by? And I think it was like a hundred and ninety three million dollar revenue gap. What's what's the plan? Mr. Mayor, I, I think that uh, comes down to political leadership. It's my job to come up with a plan, and I will. Uh, and well, hopefully they'll help. You. Oh yeah, no, these guys are the smart guys. <laughs> they, they actually will. They, I, 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 I don't want to put uh, words uh, um, in my uh, staff's mouth, but um, I, uh, if you just take one, if you just remember one thing from today's presentation for, for Peabot, I hope you remember that slide that shows those red bars pointing downward and a massive uh, um, fiscal gap over time. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to steal from my closing comments today, but uh, obviously Peabot faces a structural financial crisis. It's going to require us to do something different. Um, and one of the, one of my jobs and one of my missions for the next two years while I have this gig is to uh, work with Peabot and uh, my colleagues on council to develop strategies for um, funding a new funding model for Peabot. Uh, there are a number of options that are on the table. And if you um, give me about eight weeks, um, I think I can talk in a sophisticated way about uh, some possible paths forward. Great, great. And, and, and you're, you're jogging my memory. You and I have had somewhat of a conversation about this, and you indicated this is not unique to Peabot, that this is, this is something of a national um, trend. We did talk about it, although um, I, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. Peabot is in a unique situation. Um, every jury, there are many different ways that jurisdictions throughout America and even Oregon uh, um, fund their public transport or their uh, their their road systems. Um, even in Oregon, for example, there are cities that uh, basically have approached uh, roads as essentially being a utility. Mm -hmm. So, um, in some jurisdictions, you get your water bill, your sewer bill, and your road bill, and uh, that may be one uh, path forward. Uh, some jurisdictions have gas taxes, like we have. Um, I suspect in some jurisdictions have a mix, uh, um, and those are kind of the conversations, and someone who is better equipped uh, uh, and, or better trained in this space can, can jump in if I'm making mistakes here. Uh, but we have a basket of options here. I'm convinced that we can get this right, um, and I frankly, colleagues, as we think about PBOT, the real work that we need to do in the next two years is to reach a consensus on what our vision is for, for providing um, uh, an economically sustainable uh, financial model for our roads moving forward. And I, I, I look forward to that and I appreciate your leadership on it. What is driving, you know, just sort of in order, what are, what are like the top two items that are driving that gap? Is it, is it due to resources coming in through the gas tax that are declining or is it something we're doing locally? What, what are the main drivers? Yeah, the, the two main drivers are the state highway fund resources or the gas taxes coming in are, are relatively flat because the state legislature does not have scheduled increases to account for inflation. The last one is in 2024, and then the gas taxes just remain flat, although our expenses rise every single year with inflation. Uh, similar with parking meter revenues, we're currently at, you know, you know, what is it, 65 to 70 percent of, of pre-pandemic normals for parking meter revenues. Um, and we just, we're not seeing those come back at the, at the levels that we thought they, they would. And it's much slower trajectory of, of the recovery for those revenues and that combined. So no or very little increase in revenues and inflation um, affecting okay. the expenses. Yeah, and that's, that's uh, helpful. And then uh, last, I just want to express a preference that we do fund community events. I'm, I'm very concerned about the lack of activation on our streets, so that's something I'll take a harder look at. It was not a significant line item, but I, I think it would have a disproportionate impact to not have community events because we couldn't find $200,000 to support them. So I, I just want to express a preference that I have on that front. 
Mr. Mayor, if I can just jump in and underscore that. I, I, uh, I very much support uh, and agree with you. I think community events are important to uh, um, activating our uh, neighborhoods and uh, supporting our economy. Um, for those of you who've known me for a while, I kind of come from that space. Uh, my chief of staff and I have run more street fairs than, than, I, than I care to remember at this point, uh, frankly, as part of Portland's brand. Uh, at the same time, I'm going to need your help on that one too, because uh, you can see Peabot is. This is a cut year for Peabot, and this is not our first cut year. And uh, given current trends, it's not going to be our last cut year. Um, so, if folks, you know, we're looking forward to the, you know, our, our. Uh, we're in fact, we're almost on parade season right now and street fair season. I'm sure those folks who are out there doing their planning now. Peabot wants to be a partner there. We just don't got the money right now. So, uh, but with some creativity and some collaboration with uh, my colleagues on council, I hope that we can figure this out. Great. Last question. I'll turn over to Commissioner Rubio. Um, I don't want to jinx this because I know we got our last snowstorm last year on April 1st. <laughs> but are, are we on budget with regard to the snow cleanup, the, the resources from last year? Are we behind budget on that? We are far behind. We are right now. I think we set aside about $750,000 per year to, to do that. And I think right now we're at what was it, 1.2 to 1.4 from the, okay. yeah, from the previous storms okay. in cost. That's, that, I appreciate that. I realize you can't really predict that with a great deal of accuracy, so thank you for that. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you. I just want to also appreciate um, the, this, the severity. This is sobering information um, for us to take in and um, ready to work collaboratively with you, Commissioner, on this. Um, my question is in follow-up to the mayor's questions about the fixing our streets. I don't know a whole lot about it. Can you tell me um, when you do go out again, is there flexibility to, for what you're putting out to voters and, and is there any flexibility with the state so that we can readjust what comes into the city? You mean flexibility amount, the, the amount or what That's it's funding? The amount, or the and amount? what you're funding. Too. Both of those are are, are they're to, on the table. They're on the table. Yes, for us, we can choose the amount and we can choose what it funds. And what what are you thinking? Do you have any early ideas about what? Um, one of the options that we put on the table is if, if we did look at an increase, it could cover you know a, a large portion of that shortfall that we're looking at and keep the the programs that we currently have in place moving along at the same rate that they were. So that's one option, but that would require doubling it. Um, either that or you're kind of keeping it the same and, and keeping those investments around the same amount that they were in the past, which a lot of it goes into safety projects and pavement maintenance. May I jump in here? Uh, Commissioner Rubio, uh, thank you for the question. And I, I think it, um, it points to a high level policy um, debate that I'm ha frankly having in my head and a conversation I'm having with staff. Uh, you know, essentially, we have a gas tax, uh, which is about to expire. Uh, obviously, I'm going to come forward uh, with the gas tax renewal program, our proposal. Uh, one of the questions uh, I am uh, pondering is do we keep that gas tax flat, which frankly, you know, probably increases the probability of it passing. At the same time, we see the needs of Peabot are increasing. Um, at the same time, um, even the gas tax uh, probably does not solve all of Peabot's problems. This might be a time to introduce uh, a new revenue source for Peabot. Uh, and frankly, as, a, um, as I think about uh, moving Peabot towards financial stability. I do have a bias towards having multiple funding streams. You know, uh, one of our problems here is we depended too much on gas taxes and too much on parking. And so you know, now people are driving um, electric cars, so I'm not getting that ta gas tax money. And in the post-pandemic world, uh, you know, we see if you take a look at our parking lots downtown on Fridays, you know, people are working, are doing digital commuting. Uh, uh, so parking isn't working. Uh, uh, um, parking revenues aren't as, as efficient. Um, you know, I think these are technical questions which we can figure out. Um, this is part of the debate that uh, um, um, a part of the debate and uh, calculations and optimizations that we're, we're trying to uh, sort out at this point. Um, I think just to put my cards on the table, we would wa be wise to try to um, expand the number of revenue sources that are coming into Peabot so we can be resilient to whatever the next shock uh, to our system is likely to come in. Uh, well, I'm, I'm waiting yeah. to call on my colleagues here in just a minute. I, I also 
was remiss. I wanted to thank you, Commissioner Maps, and I, I wanted to thank the leadership at PBOT for what I think has just been terrific leadership and collaboration with the Street Services Coordination Center. And I know that that was something of a shift in the business model, and you really rose to the occasion in the plaza programs, Commissioner Maps, that, that you've been very actively engaged in. It's been terrific and very well received by the public. And I just want to acknowledge that required additional work and a shift in your business model, and you responded really quickly, and I think very, very effectively. And I, you, even though we're here to talk about budgets and challenges and all that, I also just want to acknowledge good leadership. Thank, thank you all for that. Uh, uh, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and I, I want to congratulate and defer uh, uh, or deflect some of the praise there to uh, my Peapot team, who has uh, stepped up every minute of the day, regardless of the weather or the time of day, to uh, meet whatever challenge that we face there. Um, you know, that's a leadership issue, but it's also a financial issue. You know, Peapot has spent, what, I think, we're spending, Peabot is spending like $4.3 million on houseless services. And, you know, we're kind of roads and bike lane people. Um, uh, and, you know, and we'll step up and help the city get better and heal in any way we can. Uh, uh, um, but this, um, the city's dynamic needs really are placing this particular bureau in a delicate space. And uh, I'm, I'm gonna need your, your help colleagues in helping to uh, stabilize this uh, most vital of services. Yeah, thank you. Commissioner yeah. Ryan. Thanks, Mayor. And thank you, Commissioner Maps, for your leadership. And Tara, it's good to see you and meet you officially thank you. in this role. Uh, the mayor touched on this, but I wanna bring it up again, and that is the financial overview and the state of our five-year plan shows losses of over 60 million. And it was asked, is this comparable? Like, how does this compare to other cities? And you said other cities have different models. So I look forward as we try to work with you to, to mitigate this, to move forward, um, where, where we've seen promising practices. And I do think it's important to focus locally because we deal with ODOT and another state has a different agency. So. Um, are there any promising practices you see out there in some of the other cities in the state of Oregon? Yeah. Yeah, I think Commissioner Maps hit it on the head with diversifying the funding resources that we What's have. What's that? Diversifying our funding sources is really of course. where that, um, so a lot of other cities, um, they have utility fees. There's many local jurisdictions, many other cities uh, across the states um, have utility fees. Um, many transportation agencies kind of fall sometimes within the general fund, but those resources go in, so there's a little bit more of a backstop, whereas if parking meter revenues decline, that's usually shared across the general fund at the, in those particular agencies rather than being um, the brunt of the transportation agency. And then various other um, taxes and fees um, that different cities implement. Okay, and the state highway fund, when they, uh, there's a, it's factored in that there's been reductions in local population and vehicle registrations. <clears throat> Do they consider when they're factoring this that uh, the Portland International Airport is here, that um, we just have more of an influx of uh, people that don't just live here, but visit here, do business here. Is that factored into ODOT's thinking when they make such judgments on it's allocations? On a, yeah, vehicle registration or a, a population, not really So it's a, that a linear with the, the good people at ODOT? Okay. Well, it seems like that would be an interesting conversation with the people there, because we do have factors that are unique to other cities because of that. Hence, we're always choked in our freeway system, and that spills over into our, um, our neighborhood streets, as you know. Yeah. I have to say I'm ignorant about the, um, the debt uh, for both the Selwood Bridge and the Portland-Milwaukee light rail debt. Those are pretty big amounts. Could someone explain to me how long we're burdened with this debt? I think both pieces of debt go out until 30, around 2035, right in that range. Until when? 2035. Oh is Lord! We'll okay. I think, yeah, <laughs> the Selwood debt it totals about 5.7 million a year, and the Milwaukee Light Rail is about two and a half million. When you're not in this job and you're just, you know, getting your information big picture, you just thought that was all taken care of. But it's saddled with debt for who else is involved with the um, Portland Milwaukee Light Rail debt? That is, as far as the city's concerned, that is the city's. Uh, contribution to but are that. we sharing this debt with other jurisdictions? Yeah, I believe TriMet. I mean, TriMet's going to have a, a portion of that. I'm not sure. I can't remember how they finance their piece you, of it. When but. you find out, could you let us know? That would just be interesting to yeah. me. Um, and that's the relationship with TriMet. And then Selwood Bridge, that would be a direct relationship with the county? 
I'll uh, kick that over to yeah. staff. So I'd, I'd just be curious how much the debt the county has on the Selwood Bridge each year. Okay. Yeah. But I assume I, it's much, much higher since it's on their ledger. Um, Commissioner Ryan, I, I really appreciate you uh, diving into uh, the debt, especially on these two projects. I think this is a space that council moving forward should think about. Uh, this is also just, for better or worse, this is debt the city's taken on. Once you take on a bond, you gotta pay it back. Uh, um, so really the question is just how the city of Portland pays for the, um, uh, the debt that we have. Um, previous councils have agreed to uh, um, uh, pay down um, and it probably should inform us um, as we move forward with other major capital projects of which there are many um, in the transportation state space, especially at the state level, you know, this is uh, looking at the fine print makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to get into the public record that that sticks out quite a bit. Um, when I looked at the reduction package 6.3 and you had an order and I didn't see if there was a rhythm to it. So my little brain was thinking these are prioritized but I think I'm wrong. Yeah, okay. no. So don't, don't do that. Mm -mm. No. They're just, just randomly just in order list. as they are. Yeah. Okay. Managing myself with that one. I'm almost done. Did you have something you want to jump in? Oh, no. Okay. Another fact thing I just want to know, the number of traffic fatalities, that's both pedestrians and vehicles, people that are in a car, people that are walking, people on a bike, it's all of it. Okay. Correct. I found that on the same one, the abandoned, RVs reported and towed. I, I just was scratching my head a little bit that they went down so much in 2021, 22, because there just seems to be so many more. So what, why would that have gone down so much? Oh, that's just, the, I'm sorry, the first half of the fiscal year. Um, I think it ends at January. So that that orange line that's going down, I should see that as the fiscal year that we're currently in? That's correct, okay. it's the first half of the I'm gonna stop it, overthinking it on that one. All right. And then this is kind of a, two complicated things I'll end with, and it's no one's, we don't have to fix it, but um, <clears throat> when we are in these meetings, we hear people come and, um, and have some legitimate concerns about construction work that was done. And, I've even experienced having trouble doing a U-turn on division, and that was before I had, had them come in. It was you know, over a year ago, and I'll never forget backing up on division in the middle of the day as cars were coming towards me. It was actually a little scary. So I believe them, and so this could be dangerous. So I'm just curious on when, when we figure out how to mitigate something that we've done that probably needs to be redone. Like, what's that process like? And would that be in this budget as well? I'm not saying we have to fix that. I'm saying we have to look at it, obviously. But there are times when we spend money and we have to go back and relook at it. Here, let me jump in. Um, uh, yeah, Peabody is a data-driven uh, um, institution. We evaluate the impact of everything that we do. Um, um, and uh, we continually uh, tune our public uh, roads to make sure that they are working efficiently and safely. Um, and um, some t at the same time, um, every project require uh, um, inherently comes with a series of trade-offs. Um, and frankly, the trade-offs that get made are a product um, of the leadership and values that the commissioner in charge of Peapot brings to the table. Uh, and I'll let, there's probably, and you know, I, we hope, and I, it's, it's generally been my observation that commissioners in charge of Peabot have for the most part been uh, driven by the data. Um, I will be driven by the data too. I'm looking at the um, uh, division uh, infrastructure that we have out there as just as I'm looking at a bunch of other infrastructure that um, happens around the city. Um, ultimately, um, if you're unhappy with the, the way things are now, um, the buck stops with me, uh, um, and I encourage you to uh, talk to me about it. Um, it's important for me to get that feedback, and I'll be in dialogue with my uh, staff over at Peabot to see how we can um, uh, um, improve uh, the roads continually. Uh, but in this situation, I think it's, if you're dissatisfied with the way division is, I'm the guy you should talk to. Yeah, I think my comment wasn't 
that broad. It was just that there are moments in government where we have to look at something and re analyze it yep. and make it good. And I realize there's not a lot of flexibility in the budget here because we're cutting so much. So it's just that things will come up and where will that come from? Yep. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, yeah, I think you're uh, absolutely right. And the world changes, you know, um, just three years ago, people worked five days a week. Uh, now we live in a world where people, lots, lots of people are, you know, maybe going into the office three days a week. That has huge implications for our infrastructure. Um, so it's a dynamic space, you know. Um, I think one of the things I've learned from uh, my short time in uh, the public workspace is that, you know, you're never done building a city. Uh, and you got to evaluate it every day. And I, to just kind of wrap up the PBOP port portion of today, I just want to uh, really um, thank uh, everyone for the uh, um, presentation and the thought that went in today's uh, work. And colleagues, I just want to share with you, you know, PBOT is a 24-hour day, seven-day-a-week um, organization. These folks are out uh, fixing our streets and keeping people safe uh, um, in the middle of the night, first thing in the yeah. morning, and uh, when the sun sets. Oh, I appreciate that. And, and uh, you know, I brought that up before. But the other thing I brought up that I just want to, again, a big picture think out loud about is I think we have this tension that we have to deal with. And I don't know where that table is. That's what I've asked you. Where is that table where there are many people that are complaining because they're in traffic trying to get goods and services through one of the cities that uh, is the most challenging to yep. get through when it comes to goods and services? We have people that are. Um, at home working, which is great on one hand, but they're also waiting for those goods and services. And then we want those that want zero, no more freeways. And there's some of the same people sometimes that I think are at home waiting for those goods and services to arrive. So as a community, where are we having those tough tension filled dialogues? Because I think that until we get to the bottom of this and looked at it in a collective impact type manner, it's gonna be, we're gonna continue to have, I think, um, some false, com some false outcomes of our policy decisions because maybe we're not leaning in. I think there might be some cities across the country that are maybe doing that, um, but I can't tell if that's happening in Portland. Sure. Well, I do want to, uh, Director, do you want to go? Yeah, I, I think, you know, PBOT really tries to deal with the climate crisis, safety of our roads, you know, uh, equity issues, um, just transportation justice issues, and we, we make our decisions through those lenses. And so certainly there are tensions. Um, and I think given the, our, our climate crisis and, and the high level of fatalities, there is going to be a, a, a trade-offs and different types of, uh, some, some folks may be inconvenienced or we might have to do things a little bit differently to get different outcomes. And I think that's just the reality of a dynamic city. And we are open to evaluating our, our projects and making sure that they're, we're delivering the best services possible. Um, so PBOT is convening those tables with people with different points of oh, view, certainly, sitting certainly. at the table, mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to get to the goals that we want, even if they might come at it from a different way. Absolutely. Okay. What? what give me an example of where that meeting is. I mean, in our in our, uh, our transportation system plan, we're we're looking through we're looking at our project through those lenses and trying to d determine you know what's the best way forward. Um, and there's different ways that we engage the community on projects. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And I, I see Kevin okay. is here, one of our budget advisors. Uh, I don't know if any of the other budget advisors are online today. Kevin, did you have any questions or comments? No, just, uh, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. I've got one comment and a question. So I just was looking at all the graphs and the dates and stuff. Seems like um, only question is they were kind of inconsistent. Some of them started in 16, some of them started in 22. So just kind of hard to kind of track what what, what the emphasis was on that. So maybe that's nitpicky. But the second question is, with the infrastructure bill that came from the feds, are we going to get any um, transportation dollars that will be trickled down from the state? Is that just an unknown or is that not going to happen at all? Just looking around for Shoshana if she had. I know there's there's some, but yeah. Uh, hi, Shoshana, go ahead. Could, could you speak into the mic? Yeah, come on, we got to see it up here for, yeah. for if you could introduce yourself. Hi, Shoshana Cohen, uh, Intergovernmental Affairs and Resources. Um, the, for the, with the IIJ, we will not get any direct um, formula funding. It all goes to ODOT. We will have the opportunity to apply for different discretionary grants. We just um, won a Safe Streets for All grant for about $20 million out on 122nd last year. Those are the types of monies that we can get, but we will not see any sort of dis direct 
uh, discretionary funds to help with these problems. Okay, thank you. But there is a way to fill some of those holes with those with those grant um, ask, if you we, will. We can fill possibly. Some, yeah, we can fill some holes, sort of for particular projects, but sort of the ongoing operational needs in maintenance, a lot of things we will not be able to access directly. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Does that complete the presentation then for Peabody? Yeah, we're done with Peabody. All Thank right, you. Good. Great job. Thank you. Next up is the Bureau of Environmental Services. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, I'm Don Uchiyama, and I'm the Director of the Bureau of Environmental Services. It's really a pleasure to be with you this afternoon and my colleagues. I'm here today with Farshad Aladadi, the BES Business Services Group Manager, and I'm going to start with a brief introduction, and I'll turn it over to Farshad for some financial specifics, and then I'll wrap up with a few closing comments. So BES is responsible for managing Portland's wastewater and stormwater infrastructure to protect public health and the environment. Our strategic vision is to be mission-driven, high-performance organization, leading the city in preserving and restoring the health of Portland's watersheds. Our regulatory mandates and our backlog of deferred maintenance require decisions now to lessen the long-term financial impacts to our community in years to come. We knew early on this year would be unlike previous budget preparation years. After initiating several cost-containing measures, including restricting travel and training, delaying life cycle repla replacements for vehicles, allowing hiring for only positions deemed critical for health safety concerns or core operational needs, we also examined what work could stop or slow down to manage our workloads. After taking those initial steps, we launched into the fiscal year 23 budget preparation, anchored in an understanding that we would continue to face significant financial pressures. These pressures fall into three main themes. The first is historic levels of aging infrastructure. For the past decade, post our big pipe projects on both sides of the Willamette River and on the Columbia River, we've been assessing and quantifying the huge backlog of deferred maintenance and failing assets this Bureau is responsible for. As a result, we've identified looming financial liabilities, including large-scale asset failures that could potentially cost hundreds of millions of dollars annually over the next five to 10 years. The second theme is regulatory mandates. As we learn more about the cumulative impacts of modern life on our waterways and on thereby our health, we can anticipate more restrictive regulatory requirements and greater community demands and expectations. The third theme is affordability. Commissioner Maps, you spoke to this and it will be uh, woven into uh, all of our work uh, in this presentation today. Uh, it's affordability in the face of rising costs. We are facing cost increase on every front, both internally and externally. Inflation is hitting historic highs, as we all know, and we're routinely seeing construction and material costs coming in at 40 to 50 percent higher than anticipated. We're developing an investment strategy that stabilizes our investments across seven of our asset portfolios, with a focus on shifting the failing portfolios to an improved performance rating. We're committed, uh, well, I should say first that the scale of this change, the scale of change needed to make this adjustment is not achieved by, by minor budget adjustments or cuts. We're committed to creating a long-term trajectory with a well-defined and clearly phased CIP investment approach in five to 10-year increments with right-sizing of the operating budget that supports that to protect the, pub the health and safety of our employees and the community at large. I'll turn it over to Farshad now to provide more details on our financial approach. Thank you, Don. Uh, good afternoon, Council. Um, this slide, I just want to start by recognizing that uh, while we do, uh, as a bureau, earn uh, uh, smaller amounts of revenue from sister system development and other fees, uh, our predominant uh, uh, source of revenue is customer rates. And from uh, customer rate revenue, we are funding our uh, operational and capital expenditures. Uh, generally, annual rate revenues pay for um, personnel, programmatic cost maintenance, and other overhead, our uh, bond debt service, um, 
which is both the interest and the principal on that debt, and uh, cash contributions to fund CIP expenditures. Rate revenue is broken down into two categories, stormwater and sanitary services, and then further broken down into uh, residential and commercial classes. So the requirements uh, or expenses side of our books cannot be uh, exceeding our resources. Uh, right now, our uh, operational and maintenance budget um, that we're requesting uh, totals $211 million, and our CIP uh, budget totals $311 million. And I have to point out that we are a capital-driven organization. Two-thirds of our expenditures is uh, related to capital expenditures. So we have other oblig uh, obligatory uh, expenses, including uh, transfers to general fund, our utility license fees, uh, pension bonds, and transfers to our rate stabilization fund. So I'm going to spend the next uh, couple minutes talking about uh, our operating and capital budgets. And I want to lead with our capital budget. I think Don indicated that uh, uh, we have significant uh, challenges before us uh, in terms of the conditions of our assets um, and what the investments that are needed there. Um, so uh, the majority of our capital, uh, majority of our capital projects are funded through bond proceeds. We have set a one billion dollar CIP budget for five years. It's a five-year budget, one billion dollars. Um, our primary portfolios of investment uh, include um, these subcategories here in, our, in the bar chart. We have a portfolio for treatment and resource recovery, uh, restoration and remediation. Uh, collection systems pumping, stormwater management, sanitary and combined collections, and non-process property and facilities. These are uh, assets that don't, uh, aren't directly involved in the treating or conveyance of, of wastewater or stormwater. And we have a small amount of expenditure, capital expenditure um, for support services. Uh, we've been viewing our various capital work in terms of boulder scale <laughs> projects, gravel scale projects, and sand scale projects. The biggest boulder scale project that's in our current CIP is our secondary treatment expansion project, um, or you've probably heard of STEP. That is in our treatment and, and resource recovery portfolio, the green section of that bar chart. Um, and you can see that uh, we're expecting that work to conclude in the next couple of years, and as such, the, the, the proportion of that portfolio to our overall capital spending is going to reduce. It's very important to understand that BES has many step-sized or larger projects in the queue waiting just over the horizon uh, of our five-year CIP. And these projects include uh, replacing our Inverness pump station, replacing our Sullivan um, pump station, our ongoing and substantial environmental remediation obligations. And these may be dwarfed by the cumulative investments needed uh, at Columbia Boulevard Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, BES's current estimate for total capital uh, investments uh, to bring our portfolio of infrastructure assets uh, up to an acceptable or sustainable condition, uh, we've estimated to be approximately $6.55 billion. Um, this estimate was reported in the recent CAMG report given to Council. So rough math, if you were to annualize that on a 10-year basis, that's uh, $655 million per year if we were to try and bring all of those assets up to a uh, sustainable level in 10 years. Our current uh, five-year CIP annual expenditure is $124 million. Uh, so this makes the annual difference between what's needed and what's available, $531 million. So I just offer that as a scale of financial uh, uh, burden that's, that we're facing as an infrastructure bureau. And CAMG's report, um, shows that BES is not alone in, in, in the infrastructure woes that we're facing. Um, and there is a relationship between, uh, between capital assets, uh, level of capital spending, and operations and maintenance costs. If we don't uh, invest in our capital assets at a rate that uh, makes them functional and maximizes their service life, then we will have higher operating uh, and maintenance costs. Um, and so this is this tension that we're trying to balance, long-term uh, community service levels through our assets and reducing our uh, operating costs uh, to just what's essential in keeping that, uh, those assets moving. So I will move to the other half of our business, which is the operating side. Um, we're showing the operating budget through two lenses. Uh, 
first changes in the count of our full-time equivalent employees and uh, major categories of operational expenditures. On the left is our request for FTE uh, and how those requests have been trending over the last few years. Uh, this year we are requesting an additional 22 FTE, but it's important to note that uh, 10 of the 22 uh, of these uh, positions are conversions of existing contract employees to full-time city employees. BES first started uh, this program of contract conversion uh, under the leadership of Commissioner Maps uh, back in the uh, uh, fall bump last year. And these positions uh, are typically long-term contract staff, um, which the city has historically paid premiums for. Uh, by hiring these workers into the city, we are resolving both issues of employee equity and fiscal responsibility. The remaining 12 positions we're requesting are comprised of eight FTE funded uh, through operating dollars and four that are uh, going to be focused on capital projects. On the right, we are uh, requesting an operating budget of approximately $234 million. That's about $20 million or 10% more than our uh, uh, revised budget from last year. Uh, generally, and you heard it, you're probably gonna hear a lot of this. Uh, you heard it from PBOT. Uh, from the operating side, our um, uh, what's putting upward pressure on our budget is uh, inflation. Uh, increases in personal services, increases in cost of living and merit adjustments, um, labor contracts, uh, increases in health care. Um, all of those um, sum to about 10.7 million of the 20 million of budget increase. And uh, while, and so, so personnel costs represent about 46% of our overall operating budget increase. Uh, while we have redeployed, uh, as, as Don mentioned, uh, many of our resources within our operational budget to adapt to the changing operational needs and priorities of the Bureau. Um, for example, we've, we've grown our safety and security team um, from a, just a, a small handful of folks, but uh, now uh, a much more, um, a deeper bench uh, strength for that team. Um, I think it's also accurate to describe this year's request at uh, operating budget as being an essentially a, a, a current service level budget. So while costs uh, for delivering that service has, have gone up uh, significantly, the values to the community are, are pretty stable. And um, that I think concludes the financial section. I'll hand it back over to Don. Very good, thank you Farshad. So we have four key performance indicators to share today. The first is related to employee safety. The second two are related to our piped infrastructure and then one related to the overall health of our watersheds uh, and waterways. So top left is the employee safety index and uh, this is a metric that's used to compare safety performance against na national, uh, the national average. Uh, we are below that uh, three uh, incident, the, the, um, having three incidents. Uh, of course, uh, although we fall below the target, which is the average for the state of Oregon, our, our goal is zero. And so keeping a close eye on that. Bottom left, uh, we have uh, three uh, different metrics. Uh, the first is for our sanitary overflows, the second is for stormwater flooding events, and then the third is for our combined sewer overflows. We don't include targets in this diagram. It was a little too complicated to read, uh, but I can share with you that we have been, uh, according to our data sets, exceeding our sanitary overflows. Uh, we range, um, uh, we were aiming for 135, and right now we're a uh, ranging uh, 160 to 180 events. Uh, the problem with our data is it includes private laterals, and so uh, we're anticipating revising those numbers and that we will um, uh, fall within our, our targeted range of 135 uh, sanitary overflows a year. The second uh, index is our stormwater flooding events. Uh, we uh, have a, a goal or a target of 100 events. Uh, we are now trending now closer to 40. Uh, so we've been making a lot of improvements in our stormwater system and reducing re uh, localized flooding. Uh, so we're happy to see that trend. And then uh, the last um, line at the bottom of that graph is uh, for our combined sewer overflows. Uh, and we are within the limits of our regulations uh, currently for that. The top right is a, um, a KPI for uh, pipe repair and replacement. It's basically a program metric that is uh, illustrating how we're meeting our program delivery goals for repairing and replacing uh, sanitary and combined sewer pipes. 
uh, we are basically um, uh, doing that work at 60,000 to 80,000 linear feet a year of replaced pipe. Uh, we have a dedicated staff and um, a delivery uh, program that's really been um, fine-tuned, and so we're happy to report that we're on, uh, on target for that. The uh, final KPI is in the bottom right-hand corner, and uh, this is an index uh, to certainly watch. Uh, this is our water, uh, watershed health water quality index. Our watershed health is me measured by a, a number of different uh, factors, but water quality is the one that um, is uh, certainly a, a key indicator of the health of our watersheds. Uh, we uh, aim for a score of eight, uh, and this is a citywide index, by the way, and, and this is data that's collected from all of our waterways, and right now uh, we're ranked, we're ranking ourselves at, at 3.5, which is a, a poor, a poor uh, water quality level. So we will continue uh, to uh, monitor, monitor these, uh, these important indexes, and uh, while um, we're, um, I think, meeting our expected goals, there's certainly things to watch for. Uh, there are uh, certainly some numbers here that we want to keep close uh, track of. Go to the next slide. So uh, just uh, summarizing our five-year financial plan, our 23-24 uh, budget assumes a 2% rate increase in addition to the planned rate increase of 315 so this is a total uh, rate increase of 5.15, and the Water Bureau will provide more detail on our combined rate and the impact of that to our customers. I wanna highlight uh, the major expenses that we're going to be facing uh, moving forward, and uh, that uh, is to begin to set aside for the Portland Harbor remediation. Those numbers are huge, and uh, we need to um, seriously have uh, very, very um, uh, significant set-asides uh, for those conversations. Uh, following right alongside that is our Columbia Slough uh, plan, our 15-year plan. We're also expecting some really high numbers and needs for large set-asides there. And, uh, and as Farshad mentioned, we uh, continue to need to support the debt issued for our secondary treatment expansion project, uh, uh, one of the biggest projects we've done in the past decade. And then we have, uh, we need to prepare funding for our Tryon Creek wastewater treatment plant and uh, that asset replacement. Um, in a, n a number of different scenarios, that uh, wastewater treatment plant is going to uh, require our investment. So those are the major expenses that we're anticipating uh, this, this uh, next fiscal year. And I also like to hi highlight the major risks. Uh, as I've already mentioned, uh, Portland Harbor and Columbia Slough are probably our, our biggest risks. Uh, we've highlighted um, our deferred capital uh, investment and our, our need to uh, have a, a clear um, a five and 10 year plan for that capital investment. Uh, we're anticipating more regulatory uh, and permit conditions and uh, having the renewal process be more difficult and challenging. So uh, the, the regulatory environment is not going to get easier. Uh, we, we know that uh, as, as uh, water quality uh, and health and human safety is, is tracked more closely and we understand those issues, we can expect stricter uh, regulatory requirements. And then we have to, of course, uh, focus on keeping our rates affordable. We know that that is uh, central to this conversation. So how do we uh, how do we manage this uh, these um, these financial pressures uh, with reasonable rates, uh, and working within um, the market and the interest rates that we're facing and and the other costs that we see uh, coming. So uh, this is a, a summary of our, our, our major expenses and our major risks, and I just want to end then with a th final uh, takeaway and bring you back to the three themes that I introduced at the beginning of this presentation. Uh, we need to continue to strategically invest in repairing and replacing our, our aging uh, infrastructure. That includes both the piped network and our major treatment plants. Those are um, uh, past their useful life, and they require um, uh, huge investments of both planning and, uh, and implementation. I've mentioned regulatory compliance. We need to continue to meet our regulatory requirements and be prepared for more stringent requirements. And we need to focus on affordability. I wanna be really clear today that the, the Bureau is seeking no more than is necessary than to meet the needs. We've looked at that very carefully. Um, and we're committed to uh, preparing a planned maintenance investment to reduce the risks of our more expensive emergency repairs. When we go into emergency repairs, uh, we, can, we can double, uh, sometimes triple our costs. 
So we've taken a very uh, thoughtful approach to this, and we're also committed to uh, expanding our financial assistance program and uh, expanding that to include multifamily residents this year. And again, the Water Bureau will um, get into some of the detail of that. So investing now at the right amount is the way to manage the long-term affordability. Emergen emergency repairs are always more expensive and take away from other critical programs and projects that we have on the books. Failure to invest in this aging infrastructure will result in us not meeting our regulatory requirements and will create cost could, co uh, relate cost could create costly failures that run the risk of us being faced with external mandates that will take away the local control and our decision making and further increase our funding challenges. So we uh, also, I think, have uh, some sobering news, but I also believe that our leadership and our workforce are ready to face these challenges. We've faced them before, and uh, we're, uh, we're committed to our portfolio management, to the citywide asset management, uh, we, and we are really looking forward to uh, working with our colleagues in Peabody and Water to uh, refine our public works service uh, delivery. Uh, and again, the leadership and workforce is committed to that. And we're also committed to our natural resource protection and our watersheds and our, and our environmental health. And we know that's important to the community. So keeping our, our, our uh, close eye on our strategies related to climate and, and uh, equity. So that concludes our re remarks for today. But I'm happy to take questions and uh, look forward to doing this work with you. Great, I'll, I'll jump in with just a few. On uh, your KPIs, one of them is incident rate. I assume you're talking about your own employees? Yes. One of the variables is illness. How do you control that variable? Well, this is, again, a, a national uh, standard and a national uh, average, so we're, OSHA kind of determines what the uh, factors are that go into that KPI, uh, and so we're basically following uh, that structure and that, that protocol. Um, it's why we, I mean, we aim for zero, but we can't. We, but you we, don't control it. We don't control that. So right. why is it a KPI? I, I, don't, I mean, how are we to hold you accountable for somebody getting sick? Right. Ms. Mr. Mayor, if I could jump in here. Uh, an example that the things that keep me up at night are people falling off of ladders and into digesters, all that kind that. of stuff. So, but it's accidents and illness. I agree with the okay. accidents piece, but the illness one well, is befuddling. Okay. Yep, please. I, I think also the illness, because of the industrial nature of our of our operation, we are exposed to chemicals, um, biologicals. Ah, so that, illness related specifically I, I, to I don't work think we're activities? calculating flu illness, but we're talking about exposure illness. Okay, that on makes the job. sense. Thank but, you for that clarification. Yeah, work, place. work related health yeah. Good. issues. Yeah. Um, and then overflows. Good, Do you mean like overflows <coughs> into the sewer system and then into the river? Yes, out of the sewer system into waterways. Isn't in the that river. Um, water? I mean, that's rain dependent, isn't it? Well, we have a combined system. Um, so, so stormwater enters the same system as the, as the wastewater. And right. is that volume? Uh, right, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out how you control this. I mean, we, we had overflows last week, and it wasn't because of anything you did wrong. It was because it was raining really hard. Right, but we're responsible to manage the capacity of the pipe, to be able to model the stormwater flows and to be able to create infrastructure that, that manages that. Okay. So and, with and climate change So and the, the big pipe, for the big example. Pipe. Yes. Um, yes. So the big pipe was your response to that KPI. Yes. Yes. So yes. it was And we calculated of, that there would be some number of overflows and there was some additional cost associated with zero that didn't justify the incremental risk of a few overflows That's per year. Correct. So I, I feel like we sort of did that unless, is there something more that has to be done going forward? Well, not with the combined sewer, but we do with, with provincial or um, anticipating more rainfall with, with climate change, we do have to pay attention to this. So okay. we've, we agreed to keep our system combined. We did not separate. And so this is the system we have to live with. And we have to continue to try to keep stormwater out of those tunnels to maintain the capacity. So is the current baseline the standard by which you judge your performance? What's, what's the standard? Uh, for CSOs, it's four times a year. It's a little more complicated seasonally, ah, okay. but it's four times okay. a year. Okay, so you have a specific yep. number that you yep. judge yourself yep. against. Okay, yep. great. And then I it's have a regulatory one other requirement. basic question, and you may have answered it. I just want to make sure I got it right. Mm. Um, so, so asset management is obviously a huge portion of your out-year concern. And 
is that how is that included in your budget process? How 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 is asset management actually included as part of the budget presentation and performance? Well, so um, asset management is a complicated uh, 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 multi-tiered uh, discipline, but we we are capturing asset management primarily uh, from uh, our investment strategy in which assets based on their condition, we need to uh, invest in remediating, um, repairing, replacing. Um, so we have regular asset condition assessments done throughout our system, and then we rank order the criticality of those assessments to help inform our investment decisions. So it's primarily showing up in our CIP choices. Okay, and then, and then I, I do have one last one, and I, I promise this is it. So um, we periodically have people come to testify and periodically there's an article here or there about lead in the drinking water. And it's, it's a confusing subject because there's lead in the source, you know, the bull run system, which goes to all households. And then there's construction defects within a household that could potentially leach. Can, can somebody, because we, we constantly have, could somebody clarify? Uh, yeah, Mr. Me? Mayor, let me jump, uh, jump in here. I appreciate uh, that. First, uh, the lead issue is largely a water issue. Uh, so these folks are kind of the, not, not really. part of their portfolio, okay, but uh, uh, Gabe is, it will do an amazing job ad addressing this. I also do want to clarify, um, the lawyers get a little bit persnickety here, but there's not lead in um, our public uh, um, drinking water That's infrastructure. So it's, there's yeah. no lead coming no. out of Bull Run. There's no <laughs> lead in our water mains. So it, it, it really is at the household it level. It is completely, uh, or again, lawyers are involved. Uh, um, but the, the lead issues that you hear about uh, when folks come to, to come to comms basically come down to uh, house construction technology from like the 80s to the early 90s. And during this period, uh, when they were building homes uh, here in Portland, uh, sometimes they were using lead solder or a little bit of lead pipes. Uh, they stopped doing that. So this really is a constrained and unfortunate moment in America, in Portland history. It all happens on the private side uh, of, of your um, of our water system, um, which doesn't mean that I don't care about it. And I really want to congratulate my folks over at Water uh, and this council for uh, supporting us to like stand up a treatment plant that we've used to kind of adjust the chemistry uh, um, in our water, which makes lead leaching from that kind of 10,000 homes a little, a little, 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 little bit less. Yeah. And uh, as part of our presentation on water, you're going to hear about how our new water treatment plant we believe will also treat, improve that issue that folks are facing inside their homes even even more. Okay, great. and I appreciate that. I guess I did sort of jump the gun on you guys, but it, uh, I know it's going to come up at a future city uh, council yeah, they, they sure figures, does. since we have all these experts in the room. Uh, and I really appreciate the work BES is doing. I know you guys have been uh, w with, with all of the new uh, systems, the assets are deteriorating, the increased volume of rain, all these things that you're trying to manage. I think you've done a terrific job. And, and Commissioner Maps, you, you jumped into it, not necessarily to the BES side of things, but you get my, my yeah, point. Yeah. You've really done a great job on this, and I want to thank you all for it. Uh, further questions? Colleagues? Dan? Yeah, I, you might have one. Sure. Thank you so much for this presentation. One of my favorite um, moments last year was going on the Superfund site tour on a lovely like, July day. It was hot, but it's always cooler when you're in the water. And so I just want to understand that issue more. The resources say 6.9 million. The operations maintenance, including, says 211.2. I'm, I'm being too literal here, right? Like, I, like when you look at that, it makes it really clear we don't have enough money to do the work. Um, so explain it so I don't continue to think that way. Or tell me that's exactly the truth. That's what you're supposed to see. So Commissioner, we, um, we are, um, we're, we're just now getting a better understanding of the scale of the regulatory obligation that we're facing. Got it. That's what you mentioned um, It's not the due today. And so our strategy is to build a reserve over time uh, so that we would have the funds available um, when needed. 
and in, in, in taking more time to build those reserves, we are impacting the ratepayer less. We're spreading that uh, impact over longer years, which makes each annual impact a little bit less. If we were to not set aside these funds, then we would have a, um, a sharp increase uh, in our rates to generate the necessary um, uh, resources to pay for these obligations in that shorter period of time. So are the resources of 6.9 what we know we have allocated for next fiscal year, and the 211 is what we know as of now what the big issue is going forward? So the 211 is all of our operating expenses, um, not just the super fund. Uh, so this is running the plan. Oh, I just is, hung on to that word. Got it. Yeah. But this is, we do um, budget for that super fund uh, generation out of the operating fund. Okay. And then we could have talked about it in PBOT too, but, the, but with government relations, are we, what's our strategy with how we leverage that largesse of the infrastructure bill with the delegation? I feel like we're in the infrastructure uh, work session, obviously, which would mean resources that I don't think are being allocated here, but hopefully we have a strategy. We're developing a strategy, and I think uh, uh, Commissioner Maps used the word diversifying our revenue sources. We have been, um, I'll just say, blessed with uh, the resources uh, that we've had. We're seeing that they're not enough, and we're really probably um, near a carrying capacity for our ratepayers to uh, bridge that gap. And so we need to uh, look externally uh, for other sources of revenue, including federal sources. The, the infrastructure spending uh, goes through many filters before it gets to the city or to BES, uh, and there are different policy uh, applications when they get uh, sent to the state re revolving fund and then they get allocated to um, um, jurisdictions. So we haven't really um, benefited as much as, as other jurisdictions, I think. Uh, and so I think our strategy is to uh, maybe uh, get more engaged in that, in that way and, and maybe direct more of the, those federal funds to the city and to BES to pay for the, these investments. So, sorry, and I'm, I'm sorry if I missed this, but can you talk a little bit about ramp and it, you, it's expanding access to multifamily, so right now it doesn't serve multifamily? Um, do you want to take Well, we were, the Water Bureau is going to cover a more comprehensive explanation of that, but we can mention a few things now. Sure, I'll just give broad strokes. I don't want to yeah. steal Water's thunder, yeah. um, but... Um, <laughs> So multifamily residents are folks that live in apartment complexes and typically their water bill is bundled into their, their, um, their rent. Uh, individual units aren't metered. And so it is the bill, uh, the bill is usually the vehicle that we apply uh, affordability programs through. And so uh, multifamily uh, residents have, have, it's been difficult for us to reach them directly. So what we are working with now, um, is uh, a program that's managed out of the Housing uh, Bureau um, for folks that are low in low-income multifamily housing. They're already part of a program, and what we would be doing is um, discounting the, um, the utility bills to the nonprofits that manage those facilities with the expectation that those savings would be passed on through rent reduction. Very broad stroke. And we can look at some of those numbers. Anybody else, Kevin? No, I think that was pretty straightforward. Thanks. All right, great presentation. Thank you. And it tees up the Water Bureau well, but before <laughs> we do that, we are right on schedule. We'll take a 10 minute recess. Great. We'll reconvene at about 20 minutes till. Thank you. We're in recess. Thank you. Okay.
in session. The highly anticipated Portland Water Bureau, welcome. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, I am Gabe Selmer. I am your Portland Water Bureau Director. I hope everyone is doing well. We will try to bring this uh, through the home stretch today uh, as part of our public works service area. Um, I'm joined by Cecilia Hewn, our finance director, and we are going to go through a few slides. The next one. It's behind us. Great. Okay. <laughs> So the Water Bureau is, is structured very similarly to BES. We're both large enterprise bureaus uh, serving largely the same customers. And while, of course, we're oriented towards serving excellent water, we also focus on public health and long-term planning and stewardship. And as the commissioner mentioned, we are in the 100-year business. Uh, so you'll see that long-term focus on um, regulatory public health and those drivers throughout the budget overview. And then you'll also see, as was mentioned before, our efforts to match that investment with financial assistance and employee support. So I'm going to turn, that, turn us over to Cecilia to go through our resources and requirements, much like you saw from BES and PBOT, and our operating and capital budgets. Thank you, Gabe. Um, I want to start out with saying that the Water Bureau manages two enterprises, and that does include three water funds and two hydro funds. So hydro uh, power Division is a separate enterprise. Uh, water funds are restricted to, um, again, I think that this has been mentioned before, water uh, ratepayer funds can only be used for costs that are uh, reasonably related to water services. So I think those are the key important points to point out. Um, as far as our total resources um, and requirements for the um, next fiscal year, uh, totals $543 million, about 45% of our funding will be from water sales. Um, our annual water sale, 90% uh, of that is from our retail customers, so those are your residential customers or commercials or institutions, um, our industrial customers, and we have 10% of our water sales revenue uh, through our 19 wholesale contracts. Um, about half of our funding will be from um, issuance of water revenue bonds, and we issue water revenue bonds about every 12 to 18 months and we only use those funds for capital, uh, for the capital plan. Um, oh, going back. On the requirements, I do have a couple of slides that I'll dig uh, deeper um, on the operating budget and the capital budget. So our annual debt service on those outstanding revenue bonds that we have um, <coughs> will be about 76 million for the um, upcoming fiscal year. The others category, primarily is a transfer to our rate stabilization account, and our rate stabilization account is to help us smooth our rates over the forecast period. Okay, now, the next slide, please. <coughs> so this is our, um, I'll cover the staffing in our operating budget. So starting with the FTE graph, about 25% of our staff supports the capital program. So the operating budget includes 75% of our staffing costs. Now, while we have, um, while we provide an essential service, uh, we were also impacted by the pandemic. Um, with businesses temporarily closed, we saw reduction in water use from our commercial customers. So what we had done was held positions vacant during those two early years on the graph. Um, and so you, you're seeing um, the actual costs in those first two years are actually down as a result. And what we did was, as a way to, uh, to reduce cost savings, we held our positions vacant. And what we did was we used a, uh, what we called the musical chair approach um, to manage staffing level. We wanted to minimize the amount of staff that we want, were uh, adding. And so um, what we had done was we, um, for every position that comes up vacant, we would evaluate it, look at it and determine whether we could um, potentially be doing something different with those positions um, as a way, and, and reprioritize them to other priority areas as a way, again, to minimize adding staff, especially during the pandemic. Um, we also looked at um, holding those positions vacant. Can we delay the hiring? Again, as a way to achieve the savings. But as you can imagine, the work that we do on a daily basis to operate and maintain the water system is pretty much the same. Um, you know, we've been in this for 100 years. I think those before us essentially does the same thing. So our ability to actually uh, repurpose some of our positions have been very limited. 
but still definitely a good exercise, and I think we have institutionalized that approach, where every position that comes up, we're looking at it, asking those same questions, just to, again, to make sure that we're minimizing, adding you know, additional staff, minimizing the, the increase to our budget. So we have done that. Um, we have also utilized limited term positions, and that's what you're seeing is that gray part of the bar um, <coughs> on the FTE, is utilizing limited term positions to help with um, some of the more immediate work that's needed. And limited term positions are generally for two years. Um, for the fiscal year 23-24 requested budget, we are adding 31 positions. 17 of those are limited term positions. And we will talk about um, those positions in more details and later on in the presentation. So um, on the operating budget, again, um, you know, those early uh, two years, the actuals are held intentionally low. We, uh, you know, hold our position vacant as a way to uh, produce the savings that we needed to offset the impact that we were seeing on our revenue. Um, we also look to reduce spending where we could or delay spending. Again, uh, spending were low in those two years and the budget that you're seeing for the current fiscal year as well as what we're requesting appears to be higher um, and largely because we didn't spend all the money in those early years. And on top of that, as mentioned earlier, what we're seeing is increasing cost. Um, labor, that those, uh, our budget does include the impact of the new negotiated labor contracts that we um, uh, recently renewed in the last couple of year, in the last year. Um, materials and services are significantly higher uh, than what we, they were before the pandemic um, in some areas where our critical supplies to us, chemical supplies, the pipes and materials that we buy are key to the work that we do. We're seeing significant increase above what is general inflation. Even inflation is high, right? That's what we've been experiencing. So we're seeing an increase in cost. Um, and of course, everybody else around us is also increasing cost. Interagencies that we're experiencing are also seeing that significant increase. We're seeing increases in fleet, facilities, technology communications. I think you heard some of these things. Um, so again, our budget request is a lot higher as a result. Next slide, please. So our capital plan. <clears throat> Over the next five years is $1.8 billion. And starting with the funding source, um, a large part of our funding will be from issuance of revenue bonds, and that does include the use of the WIFI alone that we have uh, locked in. Um, and I do want to mention that two-thirds of our rate increase is to support the debt service that we'll be issuing over this time frame. Um, we also have cash that we use um, from, and that's from current water sales revenue. So a portion of our current revenue does support the capital program, which makes a lot of sense, the ongoing replacements of our system. Um, and then capital revenues are system development charges and other work that we do on mains and service installations. So on the capital plan graph, um, more than half, so about a billion dollar of that 1.8 billion is to work on the filtration plant and the pipelines. So it's a federally mandated project. Um, the blue portion uh, is our treatment program that includes the filtration plant and you can see in the second year of that five-year plan, heavy construction is coming up for us. Uh, the green is um, our transmission and storage program, and that is the pi that includes the pipeline that we'll be putting in to connect to the water system. And then the orange piece is that ongoing replacement of our water system. The mains, the pipes that you, that you don't see is underground. <laughs> um, hydrants uh, that are sitting on every corner. Um, and you know, to Fasha's point earlier, this is something that we want to be maintaining and replacing on an ongoing basis, because otherwise we'll be looking at an impact, direct impact on our operating budget as a result because of the reactive mode that we would be in much more. And as Stan said, you know, when you're repairing and reacting, two times the cost of what otherwise would be facing. So with that, I'm going to just turn <laughs> over to Gabe. Thanks so much, Cecilia. Uh, so much as you saw with the other two bureaus, we wanted to go over a few key performance indicators. Um, and I'll stop, start on that top row. Um, top left, you can see number of uh, violations. Um, there we are at zero uh, violations of drinking water. 
uh, regulations. That's important because that it, when you look at a KPI, you want to know what resources are you putting in to get what result. And so we know that we are investing um, to keep that at um, that target of zero. Moving over to the right, you can see main breaks. I think for, uh, for most Portlanders, that's a very visible sign. Is your system working? Um, when you have a main break, uh, you, you definitely know it, right? You, you uh, are aware of what's going on. And so being under that target is really showing the, um, the work that we do to maintain our system, as Cecilia was just saying, and our investments in our capital program to replace system assets before they're at the end of their life. The bottom two graphs are really focused in on customer service, so examples of those metrics. On the left, you can see the percentage of water revenue collected, and you can see that uptick. Um, that's due to providing credits from ARPA funding um, and um, our match program, which I'll talk a little bit more about, and resuming debt recovery, which we had paused um, during the early part of the pandemic. So it's really critical to keep this up. You can see that we're um, adjusting staff, adding limited term staff so that we can do just that. And then lastly, um, on the bottom right, you can see our percentage of calls answered within 60 seconds. So if we want to collect what's owed, we need to provide that impeccable customer service uh, that I'm very proud that we do. We need to be available to our customers, and so you can see that investment to uh, meet those targets. Uh, actually, before oh. we go, I just want to jump in here for 30 seconds or, and ad address uh, my colleagues. Um, colleagues, I just want to point out that the Water Bureau is just really crushing it on uh, meeting its uh, key performance indicators. You know, I've taken a look at the performance indicators, I think, for our, pretty much all of our bureaus, and the Water Bureau just really consistently um, achieves what it says it's out to achieve. So I want to applaud the director and every, all the other water folks uh, um, in the room, um, and I kind of also want to hold them up uh, um, to you folks to because I, it shows us that it is possible to get to where we want to go if we focus. And I also want to point out that people have been making great decisions in the Water Bureau for more than 100 years. Like, we are blessed uh, with Bull Run. That was a brilliant decision that council made more than 100 years ago. Uh, and uh, I think it's our obligation to continue that tradition of making really smart decisions in this space. Uh, and, Director, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Commissioner. And I think, you know, with, with KPIs, we are a, a data-informed bureau as a, and a data-informed city, and I think it really is important to see these measurements so that we can see if that investment is paying off. And so we do see that investment um, makes a lot of sense and it is getting us where we need to go. Thank you, Commissioner. So a little bit more detail about our budget priorities, um, and I really appreciate uh, the CBO for taking a look at this and um, helping us determine uh, what comes next. Um, as the commissioner said, we want to continue doing this investment, um, and as uh, Director Chiama said, we want to make sure that we are investing the right amount at the right time. So some similarities um, with our budget across the public works realm. Uh, we have a lot of regulatory drivers uh, to keep our water safe, and so we have budget drivers uh, that link there. And these additional staff are being added to do this core work, uh, like treatment and compliance with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. We will be before you next month to talk a little bit more about um, that work, but we will need additional folks uh, to complete that work. And while we do need to increase rates to support this critical, mission critical work, uh, we also approached this budget with affordability in mind. And um, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I will just repeat um, what Don and Farshad said in terms of uh, really being thoughtful about how we uh, continue to support the most vulnerable populations that we serve. So you heard a little bit about um, RAMP and our budget it includes funds to make that happen, as well as uh, BES. And some additional, again, limited term customer service to ad uh, address debt recovery. This is really a crucial time for us to uh, get back in touch with our customers. Um, we understand and we paused debt recovery because we know um, how difficult the pandemic hit, uh, hit everyone, but um, again, the most vulnerable among, amongst us. And so we really wanted to um, add to our our financial assistance programs um, and uh, RAMP was designed to understand that 
while our single family program is very impressive and, um, and it's a robust program probably more than anywhere else in the country, um, it's not equitable. It doesn't serve um, everyone who needs that program and so RAMP is a step towards uh, meeting that. So as I said, we're meeting regulations, we're doing it in a way that addresses customer affordability, but we're also needing to implement the plans um, that we've made through our strategic plan and our equity plan. And so new staff in these areas include support for our groundwater program, and you may remember um, an audit a year or so ago from um, the auditor's office that uh, we are addressing with this staff uh, for our groundwater program a cybersecurity position to mitigate the risks that we've seen really all too close to home, um, and support for the economic recovery and livability work that the city is doing through uh, permitting and development services and additional staff there. And then I also want to call out just our, our workforce development training positions. These are in our maintenance and construction group. These are positions that we were poised to add uh, right when the pandemic uh, struck, and we pulled back from that to focus in on our core mission so we want to be back on track with these positions. They are eight uh, water distribution worker trainees, and they will allow us to expand our training program and to continue diversifying our workforce. Um, we are able through this training program to bring in uh, people to the city who are non-traditional to this work. This, they, they might be people who uh, have never considered working in a utility, and we're able to bring them in and really kind of grow our own, grow um, diversity from that entry point. And I, I do want to say, because um, this was a really good question that was asked by our uh, Portland Utility Board, is this all that we're doing to diversify the organization? Because if we only start from our entry level, even though these trainees, we have a track record of these trainees going on to serve in, um, in positions of power throughout the Bureau and throughout the city, um, that's not gonna get it done. That's not gonna get us to where we want to be from a diversity perspective. So um, absolutely, if you look at our equity plan, we have multiple avenues and multiple ways that we're addressing diversifying the Water Bureau. Um, but I wanted to highlight this one because we saw real successes, again, being sort of data informed here. We wanted to invest in those successes that we've seen with real dollars um, and, and put our money where our mouth is when we, uh, when we do this planning. All right, next slide. And I have some good news here. Um, I know expiring one-time resources doesn't sound like it would be good news, but um, I wanna thank council for the assignment of um, ARPA funds, $3 million in ARPA funds and $500,000 in general fund dollars for our match program. That was really what allowed us to bring customer account um, past due balances down. Um, and I think in this case, these expiring one-time resources really did what they were um, intended to do, which is that we ha are very close to exhausting these funds um, uh, that were received by water. So I think that is a good news story. I'll also point out that in the past, we have received uh, general fund dollars for uh, work at Mount Tabor. Um, and now that that facility is no longer connected to the, the drinking water system. So I just highlight this as a, a potential future ask. Um, the other general fund ask that I would just put on your radar is the uh, Thompson Elk statue and fountain and the renewal there, something that's very important to us um, and that we will be looking towards uh, the general fund for. Um, and I thank you again for all of your staff's participation in helping move that project forward. All right, I think this is um, the close of our presentation. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, utility rates and affordability theme um, and how this budget will inform those rates. We can move on to the next one. And I've talked a little bit about this, but for those of you who don't know um, all the details about our financial assistance programs, just a, a little flavor for you. Uh, we and BES offer a number of financial assistance programs. Uh, water implements those programs, but they are supported both by water and BES. We have a tier one um, discount that is for single family homes. Uh, so we have the, the tier one program, which is uh, a 50% discount uh, for households that are at 60% of median household income. I know I'm throwing a lot of percentages at you, but that is our tier one program. We have a larger discount of 80%, 80% discount for households that are at 30% of MHI. 
Um, and in both of those programs, we have just under 8,000 participants. So that's been a longstanding program. We also have a crisis assistance program uh, where we offer $500 uh, per year for, uh, for those in those tier one or tier two programs um, who have a financial setback. And in fiscal year 21-22, we issued more than 2,600 vouchers. Uh, we have a utility safety net program that provides assistance uh, not just for those in those low income um, categories, but uh, for those who are experiencing a financial hardship. And then we have a leak repair assistance program on the water side. Uh, so we help about 150 homeowners um, every year by fixing leaky toilets, uh, washing machines, faucets, um, and, and all of those through our leak repair program. We have payment plans because we know that sometimes paying on a monthly or a quarterly basis doesn't work for folks. Um, and so we offer no interest payment plans for up to two years. And then um, uh, Freshad already mentioned our regulated affordable multifamily assistance program, kind of tortured acronym for RAMP. Um, and we are so excited for um, bringing that forward that is going to help our multifamily um, customers. I think I'll stop there because I threw a lot of information at you um, and we can move on to uh, Cecilia and um, a little bit more about the rates and just comparing where we are now to where we would be um, with these budgets. Oh, I'm sorry, I still have one more. Okay, um, this is a, a slide that talks a little bit about um, key performance indicators and it's a little bit busy, so I apologize for that, but the key thing is if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that thick uh, gray line and that is um, the median, um, the percentage of um, a median household um, income that goes to utility bill. So sewer, stormwater, water, um, what they're paying there um, for that. Um, if you look at the two lines um, above and below that thick line, you can see um, what our tier one and tier two customers pay um, as a percentage of their, their household income. The yellow line, um, I, think it's, I think it's yellow, up at the top is what our um, lowest quintile, so if you were in the lowest fifth of um, income earners, that's what you would pay if you were not um, if, if we did not have these discount programs. So you'd see you pay a much higher percentage of your income um, as uh, to your utility bill if you did not um, have these discount programs. So it's just one of the ways that we can um, demonstrate that these are programs that are needed. Um, otherwise, we would be seeing people um, pay a much higher percentage of their income um, to their utility bills. All right, I think with that, um, I will Oops. Send it over to Cecilia. <laughs> Thanks, Gabe. Um, so if we were um, to look further back in history, uh, before what's shown on the slide, you would actually see BES's rate being high and water rate increases being more moderate. And that's when BES is working on their big pipe project. Um, so we're now taking our turn with our filtration project. Um, we are having to increase rates higher as a result to support that capital program. Um, again, I mentioned two-thirds of our rate increase is needed to support the whole capital program. A third of that is for the filtration plant and pipeline. Another third to maintain our ongoing system. And then, of course, a third of the rate increase necessary to maintain the current service level that we're providing. Again, with all of the cost increases, that's what we're looking at. Um, sorry, I just want to make sure I covered my notes. Um, so our rate increase, what we're uh, proposing for fiscal year 23-24 is 8.9% going forward. We're projecting a 7.9% rate increase for water. BES updated their rating uh, projection to 5.15 starting with the next fiscal year and continues through the forecast. Again, these rates are primarily driven by cost increases in labor materials, construction costs, interagencies that we're also um, being impacted by. And then, of course, the borrowing costs to support the capital program. So bond rates are higher now. We had historically low bond rates over the last five years, at least probably now. They are higher now and likely to be, continue to rise a little bit. 
Um, so that is uh, part of what we're having to raise rates to support. Um, for water, in addition to that, we are experiencing lower water usage, so there's an impact to rates as a result. And for BES, their increase also includes the liability set aside that they had talked about. Okay, next slide, please. So our typical bill, so with those increases that we're proposing, again, to the typical single family residential water sewer and stormwater bill on a monthly basis is $8.91. That is water going up 8.9%, sewer, a BES going up 5.15. And as Gabe mentioned, the Bureau provides a bill discounts to qualifying low income program. Those qualifying for tier one that gets the 50% discount will see an increase of $4.72 a month. Those qualifying for the tier two uh, discount, again, receiving 80% uh, bill discount, uh, a bill discount, will see an increase of $2.21 per month. Next slide. So, Mayor, you um, had directed um, in your budget memo one to us to present scenarios to hold rates at the same level as previously forecasted. So that's what we're preparing to slide into. So for water, our proposed rate increase again is 8.9% for fiscal year 23-24, which is 1.2% higher than what we had previously forecasted. That translates to an additional bill impact of 63 cents per month again, to the typical single-family residential customer. The water portion of that $8.91 is $4.64 increase at 8.9%. So if we were to hold our rate increase at 7.7% as previously forecasted, uh, we would be able to reduce that rate in increase by $0.63, cents, bringing our increase, the water portion of that combined bill, to $4.01. If we were um, to do that, um, the scenario that we had put together um, includes not being able to fill the 11 positions uh, that we have um, requested in the budget that we have included. So that includes those eight utility worker position, trainee positions that Gabe had talked about, our goal to diversify, uh, support to the groundwater system, our financial support, um, as well as the cybersecurity, you know, continuing to have that risk out there. Um, it would also include not being able to offer the water portion of this discount related to the RAMP program that we're hoping to implement uh, in the next fiscal year. Um, we currently have an interagency with Parks Bureau to pay them to operate and maintain all of our decorative fountains. Our proposal here is to eliminate that interagency, transfer those responsibilities to the Parks Bureau um, for them to maintain, um, to reduce our operating budget. And I, I do want to point out that the decorative fountains in the exercise that we were asked by CBO to identify, you know, the programs that we have in place that are mandatory, primary to our mission, secondary to our mission, this is one area, one of the very few areas that is secondary to the mission of providing safe drinking water. And with that, I'll hand it over to Fashad to do BES as a rate scenario. Thanks, Cecilia. Uh, very similar uh, depiction for BES. Um, we were forecasting uh, a rate increase of 3.15% uh, next year, and that represented a $2.61 increase to the average um, uh, monthly bill. Uh, we are uh, requesting a 5.15% uh, in, uh, increase in rates, 2% more than forecasted, and that represents uh, a, a 4.27% uh, dollar increase to the monthly bill. So um, the additional 2% uh, would impact the average monthly bill by $1.66. If we were not able to um, get support for the 5.15%, uh, we would be really um, very cleanly uh, stopping some investments in some critical projects. Um, that The set aside for both Port Portland Harbor and uh, the Columbia SLU project. Uh, we would be reassessing the uh, replacement project for the Tryon Creek um, treatment plant, and we would not be able to participate in the ramp program. Um, and additionally, I think it's important that uh, the bond market is paying attention uh, to our uh, ability to generate uh, necessary revenue, and they view, um, they would view our uh, inability to increase uh, to 5.15% uh, 
we believe, uh, as, a, as a negative risk. Uh, and that would probably push up borrowing costs uh, on future debt, including debt necessary to fund the closing out of the uh, STEP project. So uh, there, there, we, we could go back to the kind of the essential services under the 3.15%, but there would be some pretty significant trade-offs. Get back to the commissioners. Oh, is it back to me now? Um, we let's see. We have a couple of. I think this is the point where um, we should take questions. I also want to remind uh, um, uh, members of council that we have members of the Portland Utility Board here who also, who's, which is kind of like the budget advisory uh, committee for water and BES. Uh, they have a presentation. Uh, given the hour, it might make sense to uh, um, invite uh, the members of the Portland uh, Utility Board up to, to share their thoughts. But before we let water go, um, this would also be an opportunity to ask them some questions if we have any direct questions. And I, depending on where you're at, I may ask a question or two. I had some. Uh, um, focusing on the filtration system, something that I get a lot of comments on is, do you call it crypto? How do you refer to, is crypto an okay reference? Or Absolutely, so I think you're referring to cryptosporidium, which is a yep. microorganism, but yes, we do refer to crypto. And one of the questions that I often get is whether the city has fully evaluated whether we could get a federal waiver from the requirement. Um, and uh, the argument being that when we look at Bull Run, we're looking at non-agricultural uh, sources for that, uh, whereas where this has been particularly dangerous has been in agricultural sources. So. Um, I am very far from a technical expert on this, so I just maybe walk me through the city's thinking to date, the Water Bureau's thinking to date on this subject, and the, you know the potential for uh, a way. I, I don't. I don't think the city can actually pursue the waiver. It may have to be the state, but I, I just am curious. You know, bring me up to speed on that and the choice because it is a pretty substantial capex, uh, to say the least. Absolutely, and um, actually, you are where um, the city was. Uh, a decade or so ago, um, where we did have a variance mm -hmm. um, from this, exactly as you said, because our water um, it is so clean and our water is in the state where um, we were not seeing uh, cryptosporidium levels that were of concern. Um, I think it's it's important, um, no matter how, how you feel about it, the EPA regulations here don't distinguish between species of cryptosporidium, so whether it comes from livestock or um, its sources that and species that have made people sick in the past or that ha are not um, known to be pathogenic, um, EPA doesn't distinguish there, so, so we don't get to make that argument. Um, but for a long time, we did not have, uh, we were not detecting levels of cryptosporidium and we were operating under a variance. Um, that variance ended, we were not able to maintain the levels um, of the, the variance and, um, and had higher levels, detected higher levels of cryptosporidium, which put us into this bilateral compliance agreement, which had us uh, building treatment. So we have tried that, um, went through, um, um, I, I'll spare you all the details, I'm happy to, to talk about it um, uh, with you or, or your staff, but we, we did go through that process, um, which brought us here. Um, we have seen um, higher levels of cryptosporidium. We had higher results this spring. There does seem to be a seasonality to it, and so um, I will certainly be very excited when we build treatment and we're able to um, treat for that. I'm very glad that with our public health partners, we have um, very rigorous uh, detection and, um, and surveillance uh, of community health, and so we are not seeing an issue there, but that does make it difficult to explain to people why we are spending so much money um, to address something that has not made people sick yet. Um, at least here. At know. least here, right. right. But we have seen really devastating results elsewhere and, um, and we do need to meet those EPA requirements. Um, one thing I will say though is that we, uh, we will see a host of benefits from this treatment plant. So it's not just the cryptosporidium, that may be the, the driver, um, but we are going to uh, see a lot of resiliency um, and as we continue to see the climate change, um, as we continue to prepare for uh, a seismic event, um, we are gonna be much, much better prepared 
um, with this ad additional treatment. Uh, if we had a fire um, in the Volbron or in the environment uh, dealing with the turbidity and the ash in our water system. So there are a host of benefits, um, but I certainly understand the, the concerns that have been raised. Um, we are in the middle of uh, land review, land use review um, with both uh, Clackamas and Multnomah County to go through a lot of these issues. Um, so we are trying to build you know, the, uh, a plant that will meet our needs for generations um, and um, that will be you know, respectful and, um, and cited appropriately. So I think a lot more to come on, on this as we build in the next four um, plus years to get to uh, that treatment requirement. And what is the current projected cost of the filtration system? The plant. We are, I'll let Cecilia give you the exact number. So we, um, our direct cost is about $1.4 billion. We do have a lot of indirect costs that we added in for the purpose of the WIFI alone. Got it. So needless to say, a substantial uh, expenditure, and um, I guess it's just something to continue to, uh, as we understand the science and understand the regulatory environment, maybe the, the die is cast. Um, but um, it is not an insignificant investment by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you, the, your other points are actually segue a little bit to my next question, and I, I meant to ask this of BES as well, <laughs> but just maybe high level in your current budget as we think about resiliency, um, as we think about um, really catastrophic planning, um, you know, BES just recently had to go through a labor shortage that exposed us to some risks that I'm not sure we really were aware of, and um, I, at least not conscious of most people, um, just maybe walk me through what else is in this budget that high level that we're doing to, to address both resiliency and, and the concept of, you know, what are we doing in this budget to protect for significant emergency events? Yeah, absolutely. Do you want to talk a little bit about well, the cap? Uh, yeah, so um, our capital program um, includes the um, Oregon Resilient Plan as far as, um, you know, us having identified the areas of where we need to do um, enhancements to some of our backbone system. Um, they're not in some, some of the work that were identified we have addressed, including the Washington Park Reservoir. Um, so some of that is longer term. So our goal is to uh, be addressing and, and meeting the work that is laid out over a 30 year period. So certainly we are always planning on the capital program, you know, far beyond five year and the 10 year. We're always looking further out. Um, so those are the things that are embedded in our uh, capital plan. We work with our asset management folks. Again, they're looking at, you know, the life of the assets as uh, Fashad mentioned, identifying the risk if something happens to those, right? So we prioritize based on a risk-based approach. Those with a higher risk, bigger impact, rises higher on the list. Recognizing, of course, there is constraint resources to work on everything at the same time. So prioritizing high-risk items, likelihood of those things happening, and the available resources that can be working on them. So it is quite dynamic or three, you know, dimensional as far as figuring out the right set of projects to move forward. I'd also, uh, two other things maybe um, to highlight. One is we're looking obviously at our capital program and sort of physical assets. Um, and you, you got to see a little bit of that with our um, asset management tour. So we, we are in fairly good shape and we'd like to keep it that way. Um, and so we're in investing to do that. Uh, but also looking at other um, assets like um, advanced or uh, automated meter infrastructure. So we were talking about that a few months ago um, and making that investment so that we are supporting uh, a customer portal. So um, more resiliency in terms of if people understand their water system, if they understand the value that they're getting, they're more likely to pay into that and, and invest in that system. Um, and so, you know, there's those risks too that we're trying to balance as well as the physical risks. Um, and then I would just put in a plug for our strategic plan. It's a, um, it's a plan that's based off of risk. Uh, I've worked on a number of strategic plans and they tend to be things that you put a lot of work into and then you kind of put them on the shelf. Um, and the, sometimes the value is just in, in going through those exercises. For ours, it's something that we are 
um, actively implementing. So, and, and it's a risk-based plan, so it's something where we, um, we did a matrix not only of uh, physical risk, but also what is our risk of um, losing trained professionals? What is uh, the, the risk of um, losing um, diversity in the Water Bureau? Um, and put all of those into a really matrixed uh, risk system so that we can be addressing um, all of those. So it's a great question and something that we think about every day. I appreciate it. Yeah. And just to add to that, human capital, of course, right? I mean, that's the biggest asset for us is the people that runs the, the, the system. So the positions that we're asking to add um, helps us better uh, position ourselves as far as diversifying the workforce, making sure that we are uh, providing those professional developments um, in our organization. So that's embedded in our budget uh, in the upcoming year as well. Got it. Thank you. Sure. I have a quick question. Um, on one of your previous slides, I think it was you described if you were to take a reduction, what things would be on the table. And you talked, or I just as a past Commissioner of Parks, I, the fountain yeah. caught my eye. Yeah. Can you explain about, about that? And then also, what's the total cost that you anticipate um, that it would entail? Currently, our interagency with the Parks Bureau to maintain and operate the deck of the fountains is about $800,000. And how many fountains would that be? Um, well, we have, we had 25 fountains transferred to us, although over time those have come down. I mean, Elk Fountain is one of those. Of course, that is being discussed as far as what we're gonna do with it going forward. The animal fountains, the salmon fountains. So those, there's a lot that are being maintained, but there's also some that are not. So um, I'm not sure exactly how many are still in op full operation. Mm -hmm. 20 range. 20 range, yeah. Uh, Commissioner Rubio, thank you for asking that question. I wanted to jump in here uh, um, on this exact item. Um, just to, for, to place this into context, the mayor asked the BES and the Water Bureau to run a couple of scenarios to see you know, if we didn't go through with the proposed rate increases, uh, what cuts would we have to make? I will tell you, um, the cuts that we would have to make are for the most part really uh, unwise and untenable. I think we need those staff those staff that you see up there. Um, I sure want to expand our, um, our utility assistance program to, for, to people who live in apartments. Uh, so the ramp program is sure important. Um, on the other hand, I completely support the proposal to move uh, decorative fountains um, out of the Water Bureau. Um, this is not we are not in the business of running decorative fountains. It's much more appropriate for the uh, Parks Bureau. Uh, frankly, the Parks Bureau has uh, um, a broader range of assets to make sure that these very important um, pieces of public infrastructure and public art are well tended to. Um, I hope that we move on this, frankly, in this budget. Uh, and if we don't move on this in this budget, I sure hope that we move on this as part of uh, reorganizing the government as we prepare for charter reform. Thank you. I just want to register a concern that about the backlog as well, but I'm sure that's something you're already talking about with Commissioner Ryan. Maybe here I'll ask uh, colleagues any more questions. I think we, if we are no more questions, I sure would like to invite up uh, members of the Portland uh, Utility Board. I think we have one person in uh, person, and I think we have someone. Uh, I think we have Karen uh, who is joining us virtually. Uh, I I feel like I need to uh, start out my comments today by uh, thanking uh, both Karen and Lorraine uh, for their patience. They've uh, stuck through a long day. Um, also for uh, my colleagues on council who are not familiar with the Portland Utility Board, this is a group of uh, volunteers who provide oversight to the Water Bureau and the uh, Bureau of Environmental Services. They make us smarter and they um, hold us accountable to the people of Portland. Uh, um, I sure appreciate you being here today and um, I wanna thank you for your patience and I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Maps, um, City Council, uh, Mayor. My name is Karen Williams, and I am here alongside, uh, or there perhaps, alongside Lorraine Wilson. And we are voting members of the Portland Utility Board. And we are charged with providing independent community oversight 
regarding the policy operations and budgetary matters of the two utility bureaus, the uh, Bureau of Environmental Services and the Water Bureau. So thank you very much for the opportunity to share some of our feedback with you today and provide some testimony. And we are available after to answer questions to the best of our ability if you have any. As pub members, we are the representatives of the community and it's our job to illustrate those real world impacts of the budget decisions that are made at the city. In recent years, as you have heard in others testimony, Portland's frontline communities have been the hardest hit by the health and economic consequences of the COVID pandemic. Rent and gas and groceries all cost more now. And Portlanders are now facing a larger increase in their water and sewer bill than expected. Among pubs stated values is that water is a human right and clean and safe water is a human right. And yet pub recognizes that the shared societal costs of operating and maintaining that infrastructure and that would be both built and natural uh, the infrastructure that delivers and protects that water for current and future generations. As we reviewed the Bureau's proposed budgets, we paid particular attention to the choices that the bureaus have made to balance affordable and accessible water service for frontline community members now with investments in the long term resilience of the system. Pub appreciated the mayor's budget guidance and found these focus areas particularly well aligned with Pub's values of racial equity, climate justice, affordability, innovation, efficiency, efficiency, and interagency and cross sector collaboration. So, a core concern, of course, is the affordability of utility services for all Portlanders, and particularly for folks that bear the brunt of structural inequities. The pub requests that bureaus explore alternatives to across the board rate increases, potentially identifying mechanisms for those who more heavily use water, sewer, and stormwater services to absorb a larger portion of the increase. The pub supports the financial assistance programs that you all have um, had presentations about in the last couple of hours and encourages the Council and the Bureau to consider pubs prior recommendations on improvements and expansion of these programs. The pub supports the currently budgeted expansion of assistance to nonprofit multifamily residences through the $4 million that is allocated for the regulated affordable multifamily assistance program known as RAMP. The pub views the RAMP program as a step forward and we support the addition of staff to successfully implement, implement that program. However, we remain concerned about the expectation that the majority of apartment renters who rent from private landlords and thus have third party water bills will be paying for financial assistance programs that they do not have access to or do not qualify for. So the pub does recommend further enhancements to the financial assistance programs to improve this reach of the assistance. The pub also recommends uh, exploring options for ratepayers who wish to and are able to contribute towards supporting lower income households uh, to further expand resources that are available for those that are most vulnerable. On capital projects and investments, uh, the pub is committed to ensuring that the city's inf infrastructure remains reliable including sufficient budget for operations and maintenance um, expenses reflects the true cost and the true value of the city's assets. A few capital projects that remain of particular interest for pub include the automated meter infrastructure program, the bull run treatment projects ongoing, the secondary treatment expansion program underway, the Willamette River Crossing and Tryon Creek Wastewater Treatment Plant. So as we move forward, the board expects to remain engaged and informed about these priorities and decisions, particularly when there are trade-offs that are being considered. And the last topic I will speak to before passing on to Lorraine is a pub support for policies that remove lead from people's homes and water. 
We provided recommendations on this topic in last year's annual report and um, invite you to review those recommendations. We recognize the public health benefits that have been provided by the Water Bureau's Lead Hazard Reduction Program. And we are highly concerned that the program is slated to end as rates can no longer fund that program. The board recommends that at a minimum, the city maintain funding for the LHRP to continue education about the dangers of lead and to help households with lead issues address them. We see collaboration with the county as the best route to achieving a continuation of this life-saving program. I will now pass testimony on to Lorraine Wilson uh, to continue uh, to share with you some of PUB's feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, Lorraine Wilson, pub mem voting pub member. And I'm gonna start off on racial equity and workforce development. Last year, the pub provided a report with recommendations related to racial equity and workforce development and advancing those recommendations remains a high priority. These recommendations address data justice and career pathways for interns, apprentices, and other temporary employees, as well as infrastructure investment needed to address some field employees subpar working conditions, which include a significant number of black, indigenous, and people of color. The board recognizes the, city's, the city continues to struggle to recruit and retain non-entry level BIPOC employees, and that racial equity has not been sustained. PUB recognizes that there are plenty of capable BIPOC candidates and that these community members deserve proportional representation at the bureaus. We support the addition of limited term and permanent position within the Water Bureau intended to expand entry level opportunities to further diversify the workforce. We also encourage more resourcefulness in diversifying the upper level workforce and push the bureaus to ensure sufficient focus on the support needed to effectively mentor, promote, and retain BIPOC staff in order to improve and sustain the long-term impacts desired, as well as address workplace culture that feeds into white su supremacy and the racial microaggressions and targeting that forces out or cause BIPOC staff to leave. Climate resilience, climate justice, and says, I'm sorry, I'm wearing my inner, seismic resilience. So if you hear me lisping, I'm wearing my lisping um, implement. As highlighted in the mayor's guidance and addressing our current climate crisis, an accurate timeline requires us to be laser focused on achieving outcomes. This is also necessary for seismic resiliency. The city code is very broad in the creation and mission of BES, but narrow in the focus of assigned responsibilities, limiting to sanitary and stormwater collection and transportation and watershed management. The board is concerned that the code limitations that BES operates under, which doesn't include the language of climate change mitigation, is a barrier to progress and change. To truly address climate change, the city needs to lead with it, understanding that climate change impacts every choice in the budget process. The pub supports long-term investments in climate resilience, watershed restoration, and seismic prep preparedness included, including budgeted work in Johnson Creek floodplain, Maria, marine drive levees, spring water wetlands, and West Lens floodplain projects. As expressed previously, the board remains concerned about the focus of the BES3 program being limited to private property and that the budget cuts of 
$450,000. The board is also concerned about potential disinvestment in environmental health and regulatory compliance of BES's programs. We understand that there are significant demands across the city and within the bureaus and remain committed that we must, we must always address climate change as urban heat is an immediate need just like seismic resiliency and other infrastructure needs. The pub recommends that the city use the opportunity of governance change to be more collaborative and transformational in its approach to climate change and more holistically address the environmental and equity issues that Portland is and will continue to face. Charter change and engagement with PAB. The PAB is aware of the recent charter reform, that's an understatement, and the timely need for advancing local governance changes. The board is supportive of these efforts and they line up with some of our priorities. However, the board is concerned about program reorganization happening in parallel to the budget process without su sufficient engagement of the public regarding the potential budgetary, programmatic, and regulatory impacts. It is important for the pub to be involved in discussions regarding realignment of BS, PWB programs and bureaus. The board is discussing the governance change and may be following up with a separate letter with our comments, concerns and recommendations. Lastly, the board would like to focus on the readability of public budgets. We recommend the use of plain language. The general public should be the primary audi audience and the content be framed appropri appropriately for their understanding. The use of graphics, flowcharts, diagrams can be particularly helpful for some readers. Even as a board that is reviewing content year round, the realignment of BS programs has already made it difficult to look at trends in budget. With more realignment likely in response to governmental changes, this will be important to allow the public to properly engage and provide input. In closing, we are here as community members brought together in a shared interest of making Portland a better place to live by recognizing the public as equal stakeholders in this budget process. I wanna thank you for your time today. We are available to answer any questions and look forward to providing the, the pub's more detailed written recommendations next month. Thank you. I had one question. Yeah, Commissioner. I had one question on your comprehensive comments, or, or appreciate it. Did I understand you to say that there's concern about the energies devoted to charter reform implementation and the lack of public engagement in that process. I just wanted to make sure I understood the, the comment there. Um, yes, yes. Okay. And um, candidly, sometimes as a commissioner, I feel the same way, you know, it's uh, uh, on this subject, uh, a, a much needed uh, and called for by voters transformation of government and the our ability to engage the community in the day-to-day -day implications of that um, the amount of resources that it's taking while we're facing our day-to-day -to -day responsibilities as commissioners so I appreciate the comment I'm not sure I have a great answer or solution to that observation uh, other than I think I share it but thank you I'm curious, and maybe this is putting you on the spot. I don't mean to do that, um, and you don't even have to respond now. Maybe, maybe it's something that you could follow up on. That there were several rate stabilization strategies that were just provided to the council. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on those, or if, if you've had an opportunity to review those. Karen is on the line. Um, I don't have any 
um, I knew are putting me on this spot because I'm representing the uh, Public Utility Board and I don't want to speak out of turn. Fair enough, thank you. Karen, I see that you're online. Do you have any uh, thoughts on uh, the rate stabilization strategies that Water and BES proposed? Well, uh, thank you. I, like Lorraine, um, do not feel um, that it's appropriate to speak on behalf of the board because the board didn't come to a collective decision or opinion uh, one way or the other. But I will share that um, the board does appreciate that the uh, both bureaus uh, made uh, quite extensive efforts to provide uh, information to the board in response to many questions we had um, along the lines of, uh, you know, how mu how much would we need to give up if we were to reduce the rate increase by one percent? And so we ask for um, multiple scenarios, if you will. And I, I, I would just like to use the space to thank the bureaus for um, responding to uh, our inquiries and you know, at least providing us information for our consideration on what, um, what might be some trade-offs with reducing uh, the rate increase. Uh, so that, that was helpful, but yeah, we don't have a particular um, statement to make in support or opposition of any of the scenarios that were provided today. Great, and I, I do appreciate that. Um, and, and I didn't quite hear, when is the report gonna come to us? Did you say next month? Yes. Next month, great, mm -hmm. thank you. I appreciate that and I look forward to it. And I, I just wanna thank both of you as well as all the other members of the pub for your service. I know it's a lot of work, it's detailed, it's technical, and uh, I certainly don't always understand it, but the input that you provide helps me to better understand it. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor, I know we're getting towards the end of the day. I, it would be appropriate if uh, to ask Kevin uh, um, if he has any uh, comments or questions as we wrap up the day. Oh, man, uh, thanks for reaching out. No, I don't have any. I'm still uh, on this side. I'm definitely learning uh, what's going on, and I appreciate the, um, the the board members for speaking, and I understand how they don't want to speak out because I, I Tell them I concur and I feel their um, uh, um, pain in that issue. So thanks anyway, everyone, all for the day. Thanks, Mayor Wheeler. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, if I, uh, if I may, I, I want to take a moment to thank the pub for the work, uh, for the presentation today and the thought partnership that they uh, um, share with the bureaus um, every day of the year. Um, and uh, I just want to take about 30 seconds to, I think, summarize uh, the present budget presentations that we heard from Water Environmental Services and PBOT today. Uh, to put it real simple, simply, you know, frankly, colleagues, um, I believe here's the situation. Uh, with with water and BES, if we were to adopt the uh, rate structure that they proposed, I think both of those bureaus are basically going to be on solid financial ground uh, in the coming fiscal year. Now, PBOT, as we've heard, is a, in a different situation. PBOT faces a short-term um, budget crisis and it faces a long-term budget crisis. Um, I'm committed to working with the Bureau and the people of Portland and you to solve uh, uh, the long-term crisis and I look forward to dialoguing with you about PBOT's short-term uh, budget crisis. There are two particular things within the PBOT budget for this coming year that I sure need some help with and I hope that we can think creatively about. Um, the Bureau needs to uh, build, for example, 1,500 ADA accessible uh, ramp cuts. These are basically cuts in the curb that let people in wheelchairs and whatnot uh, uh, um, tra traverse through the uh, city. Our, we tr traditionally pay for that with capital set-asides. In this budget, there's no capital set-aside. We've lost a lawsuit and we have to build these things no matter what. If we don't build them, we're gonna get fines. We have to find a solution to that problem. Uh, the second thing which I could also use some help at uh, with in the PBOT space is, um, you know, I am trying to get PBOT to be engaged with livability issues, to be partners around solving our houselessness uh, uh, um, challenges. You know, this is going to cost us four or five million dollars. Uh, we are street 
and black lane people. Uh, this uh, uh, is a heavy financial burden at a time when the Bureau has taken years of cuts and faces years of cuts in the future. We want to be part of the solution and we want to be in this space, but the financial burdens that come with uh, um, engaging in this work are awfully challenging and I hope that we can think about creative ways to make sure that we can both get this work done but also allow PBOT to do the fundamental work it needs to do to get potholes uh, filled, to make sure that our infrastructure is safe and people can get to go where they need to go. And with that, Mr. Mayor, I'll uh, end my part of the program and hand it back to you. Great. I, I just have one comment on that. First of all, I, I, I absolutely hear you. Um, number two, we've had many bureaus, you know, we're not done with our budget presentations, so don't get too excited, but the, of those presentations, we've heard the increasing cost of homelessness, and it is all being borne through the general fund which means it is directly squeezing out other core city services. And I had an opportunity to meet with the governor and the chair yesterday, and I expressed the sense of urgency that we have around addressing the homeless crisis because it is eating our budget in larger and larger percentages every year and it is impacting our ability to deliver basic services, public safety and first response services, and here we are talking about basic services around PBOT. We certainly hear this from parks and other bureaus about the impact they have, and I don't think it's a short-term impact. I think increasingly it's part of the cost of doing business, but we should continue to focus relentlessly on addressing the homeless crisis in our city because it's the right thing to do and it's a humanitarian thing to do, but also because if we want to continue to be able to deliver core services well, we have to address it today. I agree. Not five years from now, not 10 years from now, but today and with urgency. I know you all know that and we've acted collectively and collaboratively as though we do get that, but I just want I wanted to reflect on what you said because it's just one more example of, of where we're seeing added significant costs that have to be borne out of our very precious and limited general fund dollars. And, and as you know, we have 6.5 million currently projected going forward, and we've heard probably, what, $40 million of additional requests so far. Yeah, I So far, and we still have six hours of budget presentations left. Yeah, I would point out that PBOT spends about $6 million on household services um, as it is, and that's all the new money that's coming into the system for this next uh, fiscal year. Mr. Mayor, I, I appreciate you engaging uh, uh, um, with my observations about uh, the Bureau's uh, current and future needs. Uh, uh, the public works uh, uh, um, sector feels seen by you and this council, and we appreciate um, the, the dialogue and uh, engagement that we um, enjoyed today. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Commissioner. We're adjourned.